Hey guys, Sean Oliver, Kayfabe Commentaries. Um, kind of uh, breaking from our planned schedule a little bit uh, for this particular release for obvious reasons. Uh, the passing of Scott Hall this week rather unexpectedly um, uh, made us want to be part of all the tributes that are going to be paid to Scott um, for his work in wrestling and, uh, and outside wrestling too. Um, our first interaction with Scott, we've only had two. We had two interactions with Scott. The first one was an unexpected, unannounced, uninvited appearance on Ring Roasts, the Iron Sheik's roast. Um, the night wasn't one of Scott's finest, um, but this program, I think, was. Um, of all the things that we could release uh, we only had the two choices, but this is so perfect because it's you. It's you shoot. It's you guys and Scott. He's answering your questions, watching your videos, commenting on the things that you say to him. Um, Scott was a guy I wish we could have done more with. Uh, he was hard to get a hold of. Uh, and I, I think I might have stubbornly after the roast, the incident at the roast, uh, didn't pursue him or uh, turn down opportunities where I could have. And then finally, when this you should came up, I thought enough time had passed that uh, we should do something with Scott. And um, it was a great show. It's a lot of fun. Um, it profiles Scott's sense of humor and uh, his ability to kind of roll with the punches as any you shoot guest should be able to. But it's also, it, it also pays tribute to his history. You guys asked a lot of in-ring questions too. Scott was a great worker. So this is a great profile of him all around. And um, what better way to do it than you shoot you and Scott Hall together in this edition of You Shoot. All right, we're back. It's another you shoot. I always say only the bravest in the business will agree to open up to their public and say, you can ask me anything you want. I will be forthright. Well, you can ask whatever you want, whether I answered or not to hold. That's yeah. always the risk. That's always the risk. But, um, but we got a very big outpouring. I thank you for, uh, for accepting. And let's just jump right in because we got so much. Let's cover your early days first. Butch McCourt. Wants to know how the American Starship came to be. Why'd you call yourself Coyote, and did you and Danny Spivey part on good terms? Um, it was Dusty Rhodes' creation. At that, I'd never met Danny until Dusty put us together, and uh, he, we were going to be Dusty's Road Warriors. You know, the Road Warriors were phenomenally hot mm -hmm. back then. This is mid '80s, early mm -hmm. '80s. I'm just starting, and uh, Dusty called me Coyote, your Eagle, and that was it. And uh, had Dusty not left Florida and gone to Charlotte, it probably, who knows what might have happened because mm -hmm. he would have really pushed us, you know, but. How about the name? How about Coyote? That was all him, that was all okay. Dusty. How about Danny, you good with Danny? Yeah, I mean, we never knew each other before, so it's hard to take two guys who don't know each other and throw them together. But yeah, I never had any problem with Danny. All right. Uh, Mick Whalen, can you tell us how you started working for AWA? What were your thoughts when it came to the promotion and how it fell apart? I was, now I started, I met Dusty in Florida. Dusty takes the booking job in Charlotte, like I was just mentioning mm -hmm. on the early question. So now I, I go to Charlotte, still never having had a match yet. And, and I'm there and he's, the territory starts to take off. Dusty's getting it red hot. And I'm too big to do jobs and too green to go over. You know, the business was changing at that time. It was becoming more of a marketing, television-driven thing, not just ring performance. Mm -hmm. You know, kids were getting engaged, so it's like little kids going, I think that big muscle guy could beat that guy with the big beer gut. You know, so, yeah. you know, and a lot of guys, the guys who weren't marks were cool with it. Like, yeah, I'll do a job for the kid. I'll make more money than him anyway. Mm -hmm. But if he sells more T-shirts, so be it. But anyway, I went there, and I got paid good when I'd work. I'd work on second match and make 600 bucks or something. But it was like once a month, and I wanted to be in the ring. Yeah. So I begged Dusty to send me to Kansas City. I went from Kansas City after about six months to the AWA, because I ran into Jack Lanza at a show in St. Louis. 
And um, he said, hey, kid, you ready to make a move? And I went, no, I'm not ready. And he went, everybody's the shits when they start. And I said, as long as you feel that way, I'm ready. So they, right. then I went to the AWA. Did Vern get you out in the barn at all? Or was there no, any workouts? No, or no, no. That? I heard legendary stuff about it, but was yeah. never involved in any of that. All right, here's a video from uh, oh, Howie. Oh, no. All right, let's see. Oh. Oh. I want you to talk about the Gator Scott Hall gimmick a little bit. This was a... Uh... <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. It's brutal, right? Uh, and it was the time. Well, Sorry, every, the time. Yeah, see, everybody had blonde hair then. I was working in Japan some then too, so blonde hair was big there. Um, that was a Joe Pettacino, uh Jim Ross project. And, I mean, I'm so low on a totem pole then, bro. I'm just happy to have a job. Sure. You mm -hmm. know, I think I wasn't even on a contract. I was just on an oral agreement, like a grand a week. But and uh, obviously, you can tell I was still discovering, you know. How Oral agreement does not involve the promise of rats, right? Oral agreement. We're not talking about that. You mean that they <laughs> you spoke get your to mind you? Out it was a All right. yeah. In Georgia, it was a binding legal commitment. There was no sex involved. Sex and drugs is the next category. Uh, Salvatore M. I'm a pretty good-looking guy, but even I still have to try when it comes to getting women to have sex with me. You're handsomer than 10 movie stars built like a Greek god and famous. So did you even have to try when it came to getting women, or did they just throw themselves pussy first at you? Uh, seriously, when was the last time you even had to try? <laughs> Salvatore's kind of hitting on me a little bit, right? <laughs> I don't know, oh, though. Sal, but... Uh, um, no, I've been blessed, man. I mean, I, I remember I just wanted to get into wrestling because I love the lifestyle. You know, I just wanted to be Dusty Rhodes. You know, having spent a lot of time in Florida, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to be on TV so I could meet girls. I had no idea it was going to go global and stuff, but I'm happy that it did. And yeah, bro, you're right. The the TV helps a lot. Well, it's the reason every. Well, but then, because then women can approach you and they don't feel like such a whore. You know, they can come up to you and go, "Oh, I love your match," or whatever. It gives them an in to begin talking. I to guess you. I don't know. I'm and still it's like shooting I'm fish still, in a barrel I'm for you. I'm still I'm still kind of shy. They have to throw it at me pretty hard for it to stick. Very good. I was going to say, he's, he's constructing a character here. Horsecock Express would like to know, what were the rats like in territories like Kansas City or AWA in its fledgling years? The first encounter I ever had with a rat was in Kansas City when I was wrestling there. And by the way, I'm single at this time, too. And uh, this girl, uh, Flair, was in town. We were at Memorial Hall in Kansas City. Can I think it was on the Kansas side of the river. But... Uh, and this girl came up to the, you know, but there was a heel entrance and a babyface entrance, although they had a joining sure. tunnel. You could talk in the back, but we made separate entrances. And so I'm peeking out the heel door watching the matches, and this girl comes up and goes, oh, you know, can you get me Ric Flair's autograph? And, and just because I had seen other guys do it, you know, I was so shy. And, she, and I went like, hey, but, you know, it's going to, you know, you got to take care of me, you know, after the show. You know, like, and she went, okay. So I went, Rick, you said, boom, boom. And then later on, like, I went, hey, and she was like, all right, blew me in the car. It was on. Yeah. And you kind of have Ric Flair to thank for that. You know, right? Yeah, well, I had to blow Flair. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't everybody. <laughs> Tyler Baker, best territory for rats. Um, wow, I mean, uh, for me, when, when business was slow in the WWF days, we ran Europe all the time. Right. And I like Europe because it's, it's like some of the different markets in the U.S. The fans are hip. They treat you like you're a TV star. Mm -hmm. You're not a wrestler. Right. And the girls were hip. And, you know, I just found, like, European... I went to high school in Munich. European women are just... They're cooler. Like, you know, like... I mean, most newspapers in Europe... On the, in the newspaper, they have topless women. Sure, Like, yeah. to them, sex is no big deal. Sex is good. Those page three girls uh, from yeah, in, in London. Yeah, and stuff, I subscribe yeah. to that theory. Sex is good, so... But I will say Europe, and I'll say... Of Europe, I'll say Germany. Although, wow, the UK is pretty hot, too. I love that accent. I'll just say Europe. Do you speak German? Yeah. Oh, you do. Okay. I speak a little German, more Spanish, some Japanese, enough to get my face slapped, you know. Or sat on, apparently. <laughs> mm. um, now you're talking. Uh, uh, Andrew Reed, did you ever bang any rats while staying in character, keeping kayfabe alive? No, I think uh, 
the thing, and it's crazy now, like, apparently this internet age has created so many dudes who, who can't communicate face to face that I have so many young girls hitting me up online because they know that I'm not like tech savvy guy. I'm more sit across the bar from you and charm you. And some girl, a lot of girls hit me up, I want to be your bad girl, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I was going, hey, yo, baby, you know, but. But man, back in the maybe. day, a like lot, Gene Simmons remember, has remember, said. You got to remember a lot of times back when, when I was in Rat Bill, I was pretty hammered, too. You? That's the rumor. I, I hear I had a hell of a time, but. <laughs> um, well, Gene Simmons would say sometimes they'd say leave the makeup on. So was there ever a leave the toothpick in? Well, I always had it behind the ear. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, just the, the whole attitude. It's kind of like they 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 bring it. They it's their fantasy, you know. Precisely. It's not, it's not like I'm so right. a mark for me. It's like oh, their marks for it. So, um, Kyle Style, how was the home life while on the road? Was it hard for the boys to stay faithful to their wives when surrounded by ring rats? Uh, you ever had thoughts of her being unfaithful because you're never home for her? Um, so I guess it's later on when you got married. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember at one time that I prided myself, I was hanging out with Shawn Michaels a lot, and we were working together, traveling together, and partying together, and you know, sharing rooms, I mean, we were together 24-7 at that time, and I remember thinking, like, we kind of had this deal, well, we're gonna party, because we're not womanizing, you know, like, at least it's, because some guys are doing both. So it was really rare at that time when, I would, you know, after I was married, I loved being married, but it was really hard. You know, I mean, you're spending your whole life entertaining other people's kids while right. your kids don't know you. Yeah. But as far as the being fa unfaithful thing, yeah. I, at the same time, though, I, my wife was no angel when I met her, you know, my now ex-wife. I mean, I met her when she danced around a pole. So, I mean, I figured, yeah, she's, you know, I, I've never really been a jealous guy. It didn't, okay. didn't sweat me, but I kind of prided myself on, yeah, I'm, I'm the dude drinking and taking pills because I'm not whoring around as much as I could. For some reason, that made me feel better. It was a consolation, a yeah. way for you to at least, yeah. in your mind. Right. Um, in Walton's You Shoot, he told the story of bringing the stripper back to a hotel room where you guys were sharing. Oh, let's take you back. I remember one time I was fucking this broad, Cleveland. Mm, Cleveland, I remember her. She's a stripper. She's so hot, I remember her. She was so fucking hot. She was so hot, man. She was like this Vietnamese. Uh, white Vietnamese mixed girl, real young, tiny. Fuck. Anyways, <laughs> Scott Hall and I were rooming together. He was all like passed out. I brought her in the room, and I'm like, I could turn the light on in the bathroom so he could watch. And I start fucking her, and he's fucking like, I'm trying to let you know, maybe get him in on the deal there. And uh, he's like, fuck it, turn it on. As he's rolling over, pissing on the fucking carpet. <laughs> so he didn't want to get up, you know. Remember it. Remember it? Uh, yeah, I do remember. I do remember that. Because he had he had one girl in, in um, Cleveland that was like a regular. Like some towns you just have like your girl. Mm -hmm. And we all had girls in Montreal. And... I do remember that because I've seen him fuck before. It was like, oh, it's in a, yeah, you know what? Guess what? I don't want to, see. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to sleep here. Like, you know. You remember a rat Dicky Slater? In London? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Man, Chaz. She drank, she drank a shot of poire. It was spit and the whole deal. Oh, oh it was horrifying. Wow. Horrifying. Chaz Adams, hey, yo, Scott, tell me, you cool motherfucker, who was the biggest ladies' man back in the day? Who did the ring rats flock to like melted chocolate to a fat kid's face? Um, well, I gotta, uh, I mean, I guess everybody has their road stories. I'm sure you're learning that doing this show, but, you know, I was hanging with who I was hanging with. We came to be called the click and we embraced that. And I guess we were getting a lot of bitches' attentions. I mean, I never really looked at it like any kind of competition, but yeah, it's a lot of girls coming our way. You know, we were all young, single guys, you know, successful and... Who had the most discerning eye for quality? Who held out for the 
for the A plus? Uh, well, I don't. I think overall, I don't. I don't remember. It depends on how fucked up I was. Um, right, I guess that's a little bit of it. Right? It is. Yeah. And how late as the night goes on? And how many days <laughs> yeah. you've been? And how many days you've been on the road? You know, like at, I would start the tour, turn and puss down by the end of the tour. I'm, you know, we're go. You you see them and you're going like you show them your room key and you go five minutes. Then you go like oh, oh oh man, I'm going to bed. See you guys. And then everybody's watching five. Two, one, she walks, goes to the elevator, you know. Yeah, I'm not proud of it, but that's what happened. You should be. Ginger, my balls, first time emailer. Scott, have you ever had sexual relations with a fat wom woman? If not, do you know any wrestlers in the past that got out in the bed with a chunky woman? I've, uh, I've never been with a big girl. There's never, I, don't, I don't have anything against them. I just, it's I don't not know. your scene. Yeah, it's not my deal. Um, do I know of any guys who particularly liked Big girls? Is that the question? Yeah. No. I mean, nobody, <laughs> nobody I was wrong. If you have the I choice, don't I don't know why you'd... Put, well, but you never know. People, yeah, are, you people know. fuck their pets. Let's see. John the Revelator. Oh, my. Do you take Viagra? Hit it on. He take it because he... Not because he need it. Because it gives him a super performer. Do you take Viagra? But you, John, do you take Viagra? Who, me? Yes. No, I don't take no Viagra. Don't need it? No, I don't need that. I don't need that. I'm everything natural with me. I act justly, no violence or nothing. I just act justly, and the Lord take care of me. No kind of medicine. Yes. Everything that goes in John's body is natural. I believe that. Ever, uh, ever have the Viagra? Yes. Yes. Everything it's cracked up to be? Oh, like you don't know, right? <laughs> The Horsecock Express, if you had to give a rim job to one diva, uh, one WWE diva in history, who would it be? Hmm, I'm gonna say Paige. Kimberly? What you oh, oh, Paige no, the somebody, diva. somebody oh. knew, right? <laughs> no, in history, no. or the entire, uh, the entire uh, time there were women in the WWE. Okay, well rim job means eating her ass out. Correct. I'm gonna say Paige. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see, uh, Ramsey from Montreal, Tammy spoke about you on her, you shoot. She got an F Mary kill, as a matter of fact. The Scott Hall, Jake Roberts, Virgil. Oh my God. Uh, okay, well the fuck really wouldn't go towards any of them, but if I have to pick, yeah, I'm gun to the head kind of thing here. Yeah. Okay. Kill definitely Jake Roberts. That's an easy one um, because he is a snake. He's a backstabber and two faced. Yeah. Legit. Legit. Okay. Screwed me and Chris over in Germany in 1996, so I have no love for the man. Okay. Mary would have to go for Scott Hall because he made a lot more money than Virgil back in the day, and Virgil would have—I hate to say it—have to be the fuck because he's probably the most well hung. That's what we hear. I wouldn't know. That, that just—I just—I'm gonna throw up. I heard she just got arrested again. Ah, that's too bad. When you have warrants. Yeah, you why? probably shouldn't put yourself yeah, on mean, the yeah. internet every day and, and you know, advertise that you're home. Yeah, be hustling guys on, yeah. on Skype or whatever she does. Well, let's return the favor. Todd Hamilton uh, from River Edge, New Jersey. Uh, F. Mary Kill, Miss Elizabeth, Mike McGurk, and Sonny. Um, I would... Well, you have to choose, right? I would... Have to, yeah. Kill Sonny, um, fuck Liz, and marry Mike McGurk. I had a big crush on Mike McGurk. I used to hit on her. I used to hit on her in a ring. I would, I would go in as Razor and get her in a corner and go, look at this, baby. And she'd, she'd work with you real good. She's great. In She's second generation. In considering this question, I was wondering if she held on to any of that Leroy money. What do you think? I hope so. I mean, I don't know. I hope so. I think she was great. She was so, I, I hung out with her a lot. I really liked her. Kenny Seish, uh, she gets mentioned in almost every you shoot. Who in the WWE had sunny days? So far she's confirmed Sean and Davey, but there were others. And how did Skip deal with it? Was Sean and Tammy a fling or was it something serious? Have you ever walked in on her in the act? Most of those answers are available at uh, kfabcommentaries.com on the, her you shoot, but have you ever walked in on Sean and Tammy? No. By that time, he was like getting single rooms and stuff like that. You know, we, we He's went in through, Vince's office. We went through a period, period where we shared rooms and stuff. Um, so now I never walked in on it. Okay. But I mean, isn't Brett mentioned in that conversation? Well, well that was just a, a thing, right? That wasn't real. I have no idea. I, no, I, went, she, I, was, I was just minding my own business. She claims not, but she did reveal on our show to the 
disappointment of the Hart family that uh, that she was with Davey for a little bit. You know, the people are more interested in this stuff now than they were at that time. At that time, you're so busy making towns and doing stuff, you don't really care who's. Oh banging. sure, oh, you don't really yeah. care who's banging who. Very good. Then let's go to Smitty T. Mockingbird for Christ's sake, with a name like that. Possible to ignore. Hey yo. Deep in his you man know cave, right? Am, but you don't know why. It's never I'm some hot broad. It's always some dude. <laughs> it's always some dude with a collection of pinball machines. That's quite the collection. Where is the horse cock express? Them punks can't even get on YouTube. And where? Oh, where? Is your hairline? Sean Oliver. Because I got a scoop. For you. Anybody else in uh, kayfabe commentaries? Uh, uh, I got a question. Think he watched that interview a few times? Son? I got a question for Razor Ramon. Get to I it, brother. I got a question for Scott Hall. How big is Batista's dick? Is he a big man? A medium-sized man? Or is he a surprise buddy? You better and sir. All that build-up and this guy's worried about cock, right? I, I was never in a territory with Batista, so I never got to cock watch him in the shower. Sorry, uh, buddy. The question remains unanswered. Uh, let's see, Ramsey from Montreal. And Sean Waltman's You Shoot. He was given the choice to F, marry, kill you, Nash, and Michaels. For the women out there that would be considering playing this game, tell them who the best to have a, a fun night versus marry, and then who should just maybe just be all, um, all together. If I'm doing the fuck it, you, you're right? speaking for the women. You're, you're in the yeah. you're in the point of view of the woman. Oh, the, but wait a minute. Well, you're, you're not all gay, so if, if women out there oh. want to know who they should fuck, who they should marry, oh. who they should kill, well, who would you tell them? Oh, uh, definitely. Uh, fuck Nash. If they were, if it's a, if if a woman's asking who, the, who they should fuck, it would be Nash. Uh, marry Sean, and probably kill Scott. <laughs> Wouldn't be a very pleasant home life, would it? I'm just saying, like you know, I mean, they all love them all to death, man. I fucking wouldn't want uh, anything to happen to no, them. No, I'm just course. saying, a woman would probably come to those conclusions herself. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, you little dick. In Nash's you shoot, he was asked the same question. Um, Waldman, Michaels, uh, Scott Hall. <laughs> Go ahead. Gun to your head. Gotta fuck one, gotta marry one, gotta kill one. Kid's a freak, so I'm gonna fuck him. <laughs> I'm gonna marry Sean, and as fucking Charlie Manson said, I'm already dead. <laughs> there it is. Well, two, so, of, two of my buddies want me dead. Or at least want to kill me. Here you go. Here's the forum. F, marry, kill. Pock, Sean, Nash. Um, I'd probably fuck Sean. And can I kill both Kev and <laughs> fucking Pock? Take Nash Fucking dicks. <laughs> fuck you both. Um, no, uh, I would marry Kev and... Kill Sean. Okay. Horsecock Express. Rank the members of the clique in terms of hose size. From smallest to largest. Okay, here, I guess this is in the form of a new game. Um, the clique's dicks. So, on the one end of the spectrum, you've got uh, Virgil. And on the other end of the spectrum, this is uh, Seth Rollins, right? Okay, Seth Rollins, micro penis. Um, please place the clique in the uh. board. I've never, I haven't really observed a lot of cocks. So I, don't, I mean, I don't know if I could. Speculation, maybe? They, they say, what do the women say? The hands, the feet? I don't know. The nose? <laughs> oh. Well, if you go my noses, I'd put fucking Triple H. Triple H. Way <laughs> if, if I put him down Beyond here by Virgil. Virgil. I mean, if you're going by feet size, and Kev would be right there. Um, 
Well, Shoals was advertised in the China video, so so that that you is is public knowledge. Right? I never saw the video. Okay. I remember one time Conan, we were at TNA TV when it like first came out. And Conan's like, "Hey, you want to see it?" I'm thinking, "No, <laughs> no." I mean, I've seen it with this smoking hot broad in Cleveland and turned the light. Like, okay, I've seen you fuck a million times. Like, I you know, I don't really. All right, uh, Gaylord McFaggle tits. Um, what do you think about wrestlers' locker room activities and mindsets now than what it was in your age? Wrestlers now would just play video games, read comics, and kind of be people who don't go out drinking, partying, and drugs. You think this is a good thing now for current wrestlers, or should they live a little and do some of the things you guys did back in the day? Well, the, I mean, this guy's asking me to change time. I mean, change the economy, all those things. It was a different time. Nobody... I remember doing, Kurt Henning told me one time that a lot of business gets done in the, in the bar. Mm -hmm. Because like I was getting pushed in the AWA and I didn't, drink, I didn't drink or do drugs. You know, I smoked a little weed, I took some roids, but I didn't do pills, I didn't drink, so I was never went to the bar. I'd go to right. the hotel, I'd go to my room. Right. Go smoke weed and go to sleep and get up and go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And I remember Kurt kind of pointed out to me like, you know, you got a lot of heat with these guys because, you know, you're getting pushed and you're green and, you know, what the fuck, you never hang out or anything. They think you're stuck up. And I was thinking, no. I'm thinking, wow, I just don't fit in. But um, but at the same time, I'm glad because a lot less guys will be dropping dead young. Mm -hmm. You know, they do have a good wellness program. They they contacted me. I, mean, I went to 12 rehabs. I paid for the first six. Vince paid for the last six. And by then, they had their wellness program up and running. And the last two or three weren't just 12-step deals because that wasn't working for me. Mm -hmm. I was going there, I was paying attention, I was participating, but it wasn't sticking. And then Vince's experts kind of went, well, let's maybe try re treating the root cause and not the symptom. The symptom is drugs and alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. You know, let's treat the cause. And that's when I started making a little headway. I mean, I'm sitting here straight today. Mm -hmm. Of course, it is so early. You had to, you had to, <laughs> it is. So you had to go deep. To well, find the root cause. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, whatever it is. I mean, to, to get back to the guy's question, I mean, I think that the main thing people are supposed to remember is that it's supposed to be fun. Pro mm -hmm. wrestling is supposed to be fun because when you're having fun, that translates. The audience enjoys it more. I think the product is better. Everybody's happier. Now, whatever your definition is fun is, I didn't grow up. When I was, when I was coming up, the video game was Pong. It was bunk, 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 bunk. So I, I wasn't surrounded by all these real cool ass video games. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'd have got into them, maybe not. I'm not into them now. But I mean, these guys coming up, they're all doing their deal, whatever your idea of having fun is. Ours was drinking and, and taking pills, right. you know? Very good. John from Boston has sent this. Out of everywhere that you've been in the world, where was the best weed that you've ever smoked? Out of every place that you've ever been, Overseas in America, the best weed. How high is that dog right now, do you think? You see that fucking thing on the couch? The second hand? Go ahead. I'm going to say Vancouver. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Beyond South America, Mexico? I mean, I've. I've had smoke brought to me everywhere I've been. Uh -huh. I remember one time in Kidmer in India, and we had been, and we were looking at a thing where smoke was quasi legal there. Uh -huh. And we had a theory that during the drug test program, those days, like, well, if it's legal in the country that we're in, then technically it's okay, right? Right, yeah. So we got, we got in one of those little pedicab deals and told the guy, take us to the bad part of town. And uh, came back with, we came back with some hash. I'll never forget, uh, Jerry Briscoe met us in the lobby, and he, like, I guess we already were baked. He knew something was up, and he goes, hey, man, come on, you guys are smoking. And we said, I remember going, hey, fuck you, Jerry, you're off this, man. He went, fuck, I'm the only agent they drug test. <laughs> so we all went upstairs and got <laughs> baked. But I'm going to say Vancouver. Very good. Uh, it's shocking. Ramsey from Montreal. And Kevin Nash is you shoot. He told the story of you, him, and Sean sharing 100 somas, uh, and the reason you gave as to why... You were more messed up than they were. Let's check it out. I mean, we we sat one night, me, Scott, and a friend of ours that is from Christ, and had a hundred somas in a bag, and Scott was like was really fucked up, and he he credited. 
alluded to the fact that he took 34 and we had only taken 33. Well, that's <laughs> fucking the, medical that, proof right there. Strong, broke the camel's back, right? Exactly. I stand by that statement. <laughs> you got to remember, dude, so I, took, I took 34. And I did, and I stand by that statement. I don't like your mocking attitude there, Nash. Not too late for you to come out of retirement, brother. Video from Jeff the Drunk from the Howard Stern Show. Hey, this is Jeff the Drunk. How fucked up has you ever been in the roots of a match? Have you ever been in Sandman? I think not. Willie Nelson's proud of your endorsement, Jeff. Um, uh, most fucked up you've been in the ring. I never ever drank before going in the ring. As far as when I was wrestling, I never was drunk in the ring. Okay. Like there's that video just fucking years ago when I made some appearance and was really fucked up. But to me, I don't want to be bouncing around with a belly full of booze. Right. I'd what much, about the gimmicks? I'd much rather wait after. I was never a pain pill guy. I, they okay. make me nauseous. I used to take pain pills and trade them to guys for Xannies. So, and you know, and you don't want to be in a ring on Xannies. Uh, Charles in Detroit, wildest memories of partying with Steve Mongo McMichael. I love Bongo. I love Bongo. At that time, he was going through a divorce, and I was going through a divorce, and we were out of control. And he had a dude, he had like this mule from Texas bringing the Yayo every TV. Because, you know, Steve's too smart, he ain't gonna travel with it. Right. And it, we would, we would close the bars down and go to his room and just blow lines all night. But I mean, and I remember one time, Steve McMichael's a cool son of a gun. He is so cool. And I remember one time we were up all night and we stumbled down to the, you know, the shuttle takes to the airport. Mm -hmm. and, and it's early in the morning and all they got, you know, like Tony Schiavone's there, Bobby Heenan's there. And we get on and it's obvious we haven't slept. And Heenan goes, and I love Bobby, and he goes, he goes, Mongo, I've never seen anyone fall so far so fast. And Mongo, and he's super intelligent, and he never missed a beat. He went, Bobby, don't measure me by your limitations. <laughs> and we sat fucking down. I think we had beers in. Like, yo, to the airport, straight to the airport bar. <laughs> Mongo's a great guy. We were just in a, me and Kev were just in Romeoville, Illinois, making an appearance, and right across the street from the venue, Mongo has a restaurant and uh -huh. a bar. But he wasn't in town, and I'm on good boy behavior, so, you know. Oh, well. Right, everybody's always buying drinks when I'm not drinking. You know, where were you when I was <laughs> well, drinking? Well, he would have been the wrong guy to see then, so it's a good thing he was out of town. Gaylord yeah. McFaggletitz, once again. Did Tony Schiavone or anyone in WCW announced team ever party with you guys? I have a weird feeling that Mike Tenet would get pissed drunk and make smooth jazz music, or Mark Madden saying really dumb shit to other people. I always got along with Madden good, and I like Tanae. I like Tanae because he was like the shoot serious kind of guy. You know, that was his role. You know, Heenan was the great heel. I think what really hurt the announce team was, you know, Heenan's not in the question, but yeah, I, I, I partied probably with Bobby more. Um, I remember having some beers with Madden. Never really hung out with Shivani, but uh, I noticed that when, when we came, when Indivo got really hot in WCW, and Heena was there as a heel announcer and has years of heel repertoire built right. up, heel stick that he can hit. And um, orders from Bischoff is no, he can't, he's not with it, he's got to be in, against the NWO. Right. So that all his material was taken from him, and he was really frustrated, and he, you know, it affected him. So you probably hung with, as far as the party in question with him more so than the other. Yeah, well, okay. Bobby was really good to me. I mean, they put me with Heenan and Perfect and Flair when I first started as Razor. Pretty strong coming in the door. You yeah. Know? I mean, to have Heenan put you over gives you credibility. You know? mm -hmm. And would make for interesting nightlife as well. But, yeah, uh, he's great to be around. What does a Mike Tenay rat look like? What do you think? Kind of like that cameraman over there. <laughs> And I, mean that, I mean that in a good way. Ramsey from Montreal and Perry Saturn's you shoot. Told the story of you and him in New Orleans and blah, 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 blah. Scott, Scott and I traveled together for a little while in uh, WCW. Actually, one time we were in uh, Baton Rouge, and uh, it was me, him, and Nash, and we ended up driving back to New Orleans, which is a pretty good drive, for Nash to meet some strippers so we could party there. End up getting there, the girl wasn't there, we get, were partying all night on Bourbon Street and end up missing the show the next day. 
Remember it? No. Okay. I don't remember missing any shows because me and Kev would have been pretty high up on that card. I don't remember that. I don't remember missing a show. But I mean, if Perry says so, I don't, well, I don't remember missing any shows under contract. All this talk leads us to our game, What's in the Bag, Scott? Uh, much like those psychology tests where you're shown something and you have to give the first name that comes to mind. I'm going to show you an item and you're going to give me the first name that comes to mind in the business. Okay. All right, here we go. Random wrestler's gym bag here. I do have a degree. I just want you to know. Um, all right, let's go here first. All right, ready? Go. Michael Hayes. It's pretty consistent. I, I think we might be 100% on that. All right, here. All right. This is all just loose in the bag. All right, here. Is it like drugs or steroids? Well, when you see a syringe, who comes um, to mind? Uh, I don't know anybody who shot shit in their veins, so... Maybe the gas, then? Yeah, maybe gas. I don't know. You know, I can't... All my success came in the tested era, so I'm going way back. Like, I heard a story one time. Kurt Henning told him, Perfect told a story about Warlord one time. And he said the guys used to fuck with him. You know, they, you know, the TV, you're there hours early, and everybody's there, and he go, just like, oh, let's fuck with Warlord today. Go over there and tell him, like, he, ask him if he's sick or has he been missing workouts. So, guy, you know, two or three guys would do that, and pretty soon, you know, he said, well, then it worked, and then Warlord came up to Kurt, like, you know, he's drawing his thing out. He's going, fuck it, hit me, brother, shoot me. He said, Kurt said he shot it in his ass and was pushing it in, and we pulled out, stuff burbled out, and he said, brother, you're full. Like, you're full, brother. <laughs> but, I mean, just... That's what I don't associate anybody with roids or. Well, we can say warlord then. That's a yeah, good story. I'll say warlord. warlord. All right, ready? Green. Um, see, that's what I mean. Like I came along in that tested era, when, you know, we we didn't travel with weed. You know, the the policy was, there wasn't a zero policy to weed. You could have a you could have a little bit of weed in you. So at the end of the tour, at some city, we would try to find weed. So nobody was like the weed. Well, I'll say. Um, L.A. Freddy, because he was the buck and brought the killer stuff like in L.A. Okay. But there was no, I came up in that era when it was all pills and booze, because we couldn't, that's what I mean, nobody, nobody did any blow, really, because they tested you for it. But there was no. No one th has the, uh, uh, the reputation for being a big blow guy. Not, not in my era. I mean, okay. you know, I'll say Mongo, back to that Mongo Very story, good. But that works. The hard stuff. Was that supposed to be crack? Yeah, rock. Um, no, nah, it was... Sheik? I just, I never really crossed paths with Sheik. I mean, if you're asking me just to name guys that I've heard did shit like that, you well, know... just more of what comes to mind. I'm okay. There was a time, bro, Kev said it one time, too, when you just rattle the pill bottle, the, there's a certain era of guys who go... <laughs> and he said, Kev, Kev said it, he said, I was in a locker room the other day, I shook the bottle and he said, nobody said shit. Because there was a time, I used to, when I was doing the razor gimmick, I used to have like a, uh, Gorilla Monsoon's daughter gave me gold razor blade earrings that I would have in my ear, then I had the, like the little diamond above it, and I would put them in a pill bottle, you know, when I was working, and one time it was like rattling, I remember Road Dog looked at me like, I know you hold, I know you hold, and I went to earrings, bro. Like, ah. But that's a familiar sound, bro. That's like Pav's like dog. That's why I always that's shake why it, because all I, the guests always have a visceral, uh, yeah. First name that comes to mind. Well, it's Big Black Cock, I guess Virgil. There you go. I will say, though, one time, <laughs> we were somewhere, and Virgil was always talking about his cock, you know? And and Tataka was legendary for having a big cock. He was always kind of humble and quiet about it. You know, he wasn't broadcasting. See, I never, I, you but, never and, heard that. And he, um, so it was like, it was like, he got challenged to a dick down, because, like, Tatanka's not going to drop his fucking pants in the bar. But it became this fucking thing, and he was like, well, fuck. Then, then there was, like, money riding on it. And it was like, fuck it, a dick down. You know, Virgil, you're always talking this shit. Here's our fucking white boy here. You know, let's see. These girls are going to be the judge. Maybe they need to fluff it, whatever, whatever, you know? Right. And, and Virgil backed out. Wow. Wow. So this may all be uh, just conjecture. Salvatore M. You obviously don't have to name names, but what's the most insane steroid cycle you've ever heard a fellow wrestler do, or were most cycles just the basic shot of test, shot of deca once a week cycle that most wrestlers say they did back in the day? 
I mean, that's what I did, and I never did a lot of tests because I have a high testosterone level naturally. You know, I'm hairy and shit. I got a deep voice. I did the DECA, and I did like once every 10 days. Because the guys, the first time I ever got into weightlifting, I was 230, you know, and I ran cross country in high school. And I went from 230 to 292 steroid free. Wow. But, and the guy, I remember being in the gym in Florida, and this guy who was training me, you know, and I, I would see other guys like swelling up, and I go, hey, what about that? And he'd go, and he'd go, nah, man, easy come, easy go. Let's check them out in a couple months when they go off. And then he said, listen, you know, because the stuff then in Florida, it was legal, and it was for sale in the gym, mm -hmm. it was everywhere. And he said, I'll make a deal with you. You don't miss a meal or a workout for five years, then we'll talk. So I went religiously and went to 292. Then on my first cycle, I took like a shot of deck every 10 days, and I got down to about 280, and I looked like I was 400. I mean, just, you know. But the whole idea is to get as big as you can clean, then go on some shit. Just like accent. the guy's taking a shortcut, then they don't have any base, and when they come on, I mean, I'm 56 now, you know. Still got some foundation. Very good. Ramsey from Montreal again. Uh, in Timeline, the History of WCW, our show with uh, Vince Russo. You spoke about your sobriety at work, whether or not you deserved as many chances as you had. Did he show up in no condition to work, or did somewhere along the line he was in no condition to work? Okay. I'd say more the latter. Okay. I'd say as the night progressed, he was in less and less of a condition to work. Should he have had the spotlight taken away much sooner? He probably should have, but I mean, I would probably be as guilty as that more than anybody because you, you, you have that hope. You have that hope. You, you remember what the guy was. You know, like, I don't even want to say in his prime because he, he didn't need to be in his prime. You, you remember what the guy was and you remember the gifts the guy had and you just always have that hope that, you know, the next time you put him out there, you're going to see that guy. It's like you're just, you're holding on to it that you're going to see that guy. And then it's just, it's, 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 you know, time after time after time when you're let down, you just, you, for some reason, you still believe tonight's the night we're going to see him. You know, and that's, that's, that's our error, you know. What are your thoughts on Vince? Um... I remember it, I felt like he was, uh, I don't, never really remember having that much interaction with him. I think that he had the reputation as being the guy who was booking WWE for yeah. success. And nothing happens up there without Vince micromanaging it. He's driving Triple H crazy doing that today. <laughs> so he was able to bluff these guys in WCW, these hillbillies down there, into thinking he was the guy. So he came in and got a control and all that. And his brilliant idea was to put back together the NWO. So, I mean, how sharp is he? I mean, that, that's, it's all, that's what he did. He put the band back together, you know? And he threw Jeff Jarrett in there and stuff. So, I mean, I, I think he got a lot of credit that he didn't deserve. Ryan Costello. What was the thought behind the angle on Nitro where Hall appears to be drinking and drunk in a match with Luger? Nash, Conan, and Bischoff uh, come to ringside and Hall vomits on Eric. WWE did a similar angle with Hawk. How did Hall feel about this idea? Whose idea was it? What was the long-term plan if there even was one? What does he think about it now? Um, I remember it was Bischoff's idea because, because of this internet age, now everybody knew what was going on in my personal life, and I was drinking after every show. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, I didn't care. I my real life had fallen apart, you know, I, re I didn't want to be divorced. And my fake life was mildly satisfying, so I didn't, I didn't like me at that time, so right. I really could care less what anybody else thought. But the, the, to start making it an angle on TV was Bischoff's idea. And I remember saying, Eric, like, I'll do whatever you want, bro. I need these big ass paychecks, whatever you need. And I'll do it as good as I can. And, and that's why I would stumble around and be, like, like I said before, you, I can't work with a belly full of booze. Mm -hmm. Was I drinking after the show? Hell yes. I mean, as soon as my segment was done, because Hulk had beer in his locker room in his contract. Right. And, uh, but, and the thing with the vomit, people comment on that a lot, it was, you, I think I had Virgil out there with me, because I always used him as a prop, and he would carry, like, we'd put diet soda and stuff and put an umbrella in it. But he had, I had, like, cream mushroom soup. So if, if you see before the spit take, I'll, I'll take the glass from Virgil, take a sip, and then... Uh, to right. make it fan out, I did it through my fingers. Because I remember hearing in The Exorcist that that's what they use, cream of mushroom soup. Interesting. When she spit on them, so I 
went with my exorcist. Uh, Jason Worthing, just this past spring, New Jersey, you were at a JCW event and escorted out of the event for, uh, for allegedly being intoxicated. The story was picked up by TMZ. Could you tell us your side of the story and will you ever do business with JCW, GCW again? Let me see this. This is me, and this is me just arriving, uh -huh. and then they show like I'm leaving. I arrived, I sat in a locker room for three hours. <laughs> I came in, got a big pop. This guy's talking, this guy's burying Pac, because Pac's not there. And see, now they're gonna cut, and now I'm going out. See, I go back to the locker room. Oh, I thought they were showing. Yeah, oh, they, okay. now, hours later, I'm leaving. But yeah, I was hammered. But I was there to sign autographs, and I was there for like six, seven hours, and nobody ever came to get me. Because it turned out that these guys didn't pay anybody. Nobody got paid, and they know I get my money, so they went, and I gave them a way out by drinking, so they went, ooh, get him out of here. So they had the cop come tell me to leave, because that was at Skate and Surf, some big park in Asbury, New Jersey, and they had co-promoted the deal with that JCW guy, who I don't have a problem with them. But, uh, they, they weren't paying, and everybody's nervous because they know I get my money. So they don't want a scene, so we'll get them out. And they had the cop tell me to leave, and I left. So you thought that was a way out for them to, to uh, avoid giving you a payday? Well, they didn't pay anybody. Right, but I mean in particular you. Well, I think they didn't want me there because I'm going to maybe make a scene. Right. For sure. Who else got, screwed? No, Who mean, else got screwed out of the pay? I know, I, the only one, one I know of was Jake. Jake. Jake didn't get paid. And no, but the thing is, yeah, <clears> that, <throat> no, that I, I gave him a way out by being drunk. Shouldn't have been drunk. All right, Salvatore M, in retrospect and on a psychological level, how much of your drug abuse do you consider a big fuck you to your great Santini-like upbringing and unresolved issues with your alcoholic military father? I can relate because I too have created some demons that have come about as manifestations of unresolved father issues. Oh, why am I big, what big words you know, Salvatore. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, did, I have seen the great Santini, the guy who wrote it's from Daytona Beach, Florida. And I can relate to it. It's one of my favorite movies, like a warrior in a time of peace, you know, and he was frustrated. And I grew up in strict army bases. My old man was a big shot and, uh, and a raging alcoholic, as my mother was at that time. You know, she's since stopped. My dad died 20 years clean. But uh, I, I haven't, being a parent now, I, my parents were doing the best they could. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have any, I had a hard on for my father for a lot of years. The last time I saw him, he was in a coma. You know, and I remember going to him, hey, I forgive you if you forgive me. You know, it's just, uh, wow. I think, you know, my, my parents were doing the best they can. I was never abused. I never missed a meal, any of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I'm doing the best I can with my kids. You know, they don't give you a manual. They just hand you the kid. So, and good luck with your demons, Salvatore. In your, uh, in your treatment where you talked about kind of having to get to the root cause as opposed to the surface stuff, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. the is that a place that you went down? You know what? You know yeah. what? You know what? I was at this place, uh, Miniature Institute in Houston, and the WWE sent me there. And um, after seven hours of like psych testing, you know, the new results came in, and the guy said the main diagnosis was negative self image. He said, You mask it by being cocky and arrogant and everything. He said, But anybody with any training can see through it. You're super insecure and all that. And I went, Wow, bingo. And then he went, uh, next is post-traumatic stress disorder. And then third was polysubstance abuse. He's going, I'm not sure you've even crossed over into full-blown addiction. But he said, until you address these other issues, your chances of remaining sober are pretty slim. Ooh, so when, when, he, when he said that, I went, oh, you mean the shooting? Because I was involved in a shooting years ago. And a guy died at my feet. And uh, he pulled a gun on me, blah, blah, blah. We wrestled around. He got shot in the head. And uh, I said, oh, the shooting, you mean? Because I, you know, I never dealt with it. I held it in. I stayed, it was over a girl. I stayed with her for eight years, just you know, thinking, we better be in love. Somebody's dead. You know, a guy, you know, like it, was, it was horrifying. I never sought help. And but I said, oh, the shooting, he went, no. He goes, no, that's real. He said, I'm talking about the way you grew up. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, because at an early age, I learned to fake things. Like, um, 
when we sat in the front row of church, my dad was a big time war hero, everything, pilot, big deal. My mother was a model, like gorgeous. And so we sit in the front row at church, you know, and then behind closed doors, like all hell would break loose. But right. I didn't know the difference. You know, it was normal to me. I remember the first time I had a sleepover at one of my buddy's houses. I'm thinking, wow, it's like dinner time. Your dad's not drunk yet? I'm like, wow, what's wrong with your what's wrong with your dad? Your dad right. doesn't your dad doesn't even drink. What a puss. You only know what you know. What a puss, you know. Wow. Okay. Uh let's see. Uh Todd Hamilton, River Ridge. How'd you get help from Diamond Dallas Page with DDP Yoga? And blah, blah, blah. are you and Jake Roberts both thankful he helped to save your life? Well, yeah, I'm, obviously I'm happy that Dally reached out to me because to me it was like I knew something had to change. I've never been in denial about my demons. Um, and in fact, I've sought treatment. I've always went. I've always participated and you know, paid attention. The 12-step stuff just wasn't sticking for me. And uh, I was thinking, I knew I was drinking myself to death. It was either, wow, rehab again, or and then Dallas reached out to me. So I remember thinking, yeah, fuck it, I'll go hang out with my buddy. And But yeah, and I'm so thankful to Dallas for reintroducing me to myself and restoring hope. Yeah, Excellent. I'm very thankful for him. Very nice. And yeah, and I do the DDP yoga. You know, I'm wearing, I'm rocking the DDP yoga hat right now. Bang! Nestor Castro, I looked up your net worth, which is at two million. My question is, why make the fans pay for your surgery when you're a millionaire? Um, that was all Dallas is doing. I wasn't going to ask anybody for anything. It was Dallas is doing. Really, and, and everybody got phone calls and shirts and Skype calls and signed autographs. It wasn't really, and, you know, it wasn't free, but you know, thank you to everybody who contributed. Um, it was more of a thing because I didn't care about me. So... You know, I was in a really a funk in a bad place. It was the thing that I benefited most from that whole Indiegogo thing was people reaching out to me. I mean, we, we were at $80,000 overnight. Like, it went bang. I went like, oh, my God. Like, wow, that people, like, I remember talking to Jay going, well, people care about us when we don't care about us. I was so amazed. I was so, because I've never, I wasn't an internet guy. I've been online two years. So... I only knew the reaction I got from fans in the audience or on the road and stuff like that. I didn't know people were doing this tribute videos and all kinds of stuff. And people have websites dedicated to me. I didn't know any of that. Mm. And uh, I'm really thankful for it. But I was so naive about that and had, had no idea that anybody even remembered who I was. You know, And so that kind of snapped me out of it and then got me back on the right track. Salvatore, and you've known Marty Gennetti for a long time. One of your more famous stories was about kicking the shit out of him when you broke uh, in, in Kansas City. But Marty has fallen on some really hard times and needs help. Could you, Jake, and DDP bring him to the accountability crib and give him the help he needs? Um, I, I like Marty. And yeah, I did beat his ass one time, but, and that's an old story. And he had it coming. And, uh, but I'm going to see Marty October 24th at a show in Rome, Georgia. And I look forward to talking to him. I remember talking to Pac, and Kid said that um, Marty doesn't see. I never. I always knew I had a problem. I was never in denial about it. Kid said Marty, in his opinions, in denial. He thinks he doesn't have a problem. He's just, he's just partying. Like so, I don't know. I haven't seen him in a long, long time, and I look forward to seeing him. Kyle Style. Owen, Kurt, Bossman, Yoko, Eddie Gilbert, and Guerrero, Luis Piccoli. What is yours and Jake's secret to immortality? Well, first of all, he, Kyle, you're a fucking jack off by having Owen's name on this yeah, list. Yeah, that doesn't make because much Because all these other either. guys died of drug related yeah. things, and Owen died in a horrible tragedy, you know? So fuck He might just Kyle. be saying that a lot of, of wrestlers are, are oh, taken dead. by any means. Okay, sorry, young. Kyle. Sorry and for you're, healing on you, Kyle, but I was really, I was really close to Owen. Um, I don't know. I, I actually have been thinking about that lately because there's a lot of times when I didn't care about dying. I wasn't going to kill myself, but I really didn't care if I died. And, you know, I figured, hell, I've already had a good run. Fuck it. You know, you know, I, I'm living in my ex-wife's dream house, this big fucking mansion on the lake and on 20 acres, horses, the whole fucking deal. I got a garage full of jet skis and four wheelers and no one to play with. I'm in a fucking... Like, it was so crazy. Like, all the toys going to play with. Big fucking dream house all by myself. Like, what the fuck? And it, 
I don't know. I can't remember what the question was. Right? Well, it was uh, the the immortality. Are you no, drinking I mean, from the same no, cup no, Keith Richards is? Maybe. No, uh, maybe. You know, I think I think that um, I I've been thinking about that lately. Like, wow, like um, maybe it's so. I'm here now, like straight, and and I can, I can tell anybody out there, like, hey, like, I'm not, I'm not a hypocrite about it. I don't say that drugs and booze don't work because they do. They're fun. They work. But what sucks is when you want to quit and you can't, and then you hurt everybody around you. So the only people who hang out with you are your hardcore f best buds and like your family. And pretty soon you alienate them. You lie to them. Whatever. And my lowest point was when I couldn't keep a promise to myself. I would look in the mirror and go, I'm not drinking today. And a couple hours later, then I'd be going, oh, fuck it. You know, then, it, then I'd spiral and say, what the fuck? It doesn't even matter. What the fuck? I'm not hurting anybody. Fuck it. You know, just. So maybe, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm here to, because I don't lie about it. I'm open about it. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. it works. I miss drinking. I'm just, I don't have anything against booze. I'm just not successful at it. What was your go-to, Drew? Drink? Yeah. Um, I was always, if it was up to me, I would just take Xanax and not even drink. I love that feeling of just like, ah, uh, anti-anxiety, ah. Uh. But then I remember Kurt pointed out to me that, you know, alcohol, you know, it kicks them in better, you know, it, it magnifies them. Really? Yeah. Pizza too, right? Yeah, well, that was with the Somas. <laughs> oh, that was Somas, okay. But, uh, yeah, that was me. And I, I, we, the Click always drank Coors Light until we got around Hulk. And then we started drinking Miller Lite in cans, because Hulk drinks Miller Lite in cans. And we're thinking, bro, cans? Like, we're Coors Light in a bottle. And he has cans. And we're going, I'm going like, what's with the cans, bro? And he goes, bro, you know, you got a pretty big mug. You know, they don't serve, they don't serve soda in bottles anymore. He says, you know, you, you know, like, he's talking about drinking down the road while you're driving. He's going, bro, you know, you can, you can hide a can with your hand. So it made sense to me. Some drinking beer with the Hawkster, things are good. Howie in Las Vegas, what are your memories of being on the Jerry Springer show in 1995 and surprising the two children that had HIV? I mean, I thought it was really cool. You never know. And see, Jerry was still trying to be, uh, do a, a legit show then. You know, he wasn't just doing what he does now. He was, and it was in Chicago, and he was really trying to do cool things. and. You know, the, the one kid wanted to meet me, so it was like, wow, how do you say no? And I had to wrestle, I think, in L.A. that night, and I went with somebody from the office and, and saw it, and I was so moved that, like, you know, because it's just like doing Make-A-Wish things. The kids don't know you're coming, but their parents know, and everybody oh, yeah. knows. So you meet them in the back. They're, oh, thank you for coming, and then, you know, like, I start getting teared up, and and, uh, and I'm so thankful my kids are healthy. and. And I went out there, then I was so moved, and like, then they cut to a break, and I had to go. And I was gonna, I said to Jerry, like, I wanna give, I'm gonna give the kid my belt. And he went, oh, we wanna do that on the air? And I said, no, it doesn't have to be on the air, bro. And that's not what I'm after. I just want the kid to have the belt. And he went, no, no, we wanna do it. It was like, okay. And this was before replica belts. I gave the kid the shoot belt that I was gonna wear that night in LA. And then I had to call the office and speak to Vince and, and uh, Vince, please make sure there's an IC belt in L.A. And well, what happened? You lose it? And I said, no. I said, I gave it to this kid. He went, what? I said, he was dying of AIDS, man. I said, if it's a problem, I'll pay for it. He went, oh, no, no, absolutely not. You did the right thing. Like, good job. I learned early on that you can always shame the money guy. The guy who has more money, if you go, hey, listen, I'll pay. Then they go, oh, no, no, it's not a question of money. And it wasn't. Vince didn't care about the money. It was like, what happened? Because they didn't have a million belts back then. They didn't have fake ones that looked legit. And, and it was really moving. And I stay in touch with the girl. Hydea was the girl's name. And she's a big time HIV activist. And now Hydea Broadbent. That's great. Yeah. Video from Chad McGee. I hope this is as inspirational as the prior story. Oh, okay. Sweet. See how long he holds it. How long do I leave it? Yeah? Okay. Oh, this is sweet. He's holding it. He's oh, staying yeah. in character. Yeah, good. Good job. 
Uh -huh. Again, again, it's never some smoking hot young broad. It's some dude. Who, oh, that wasn't. I didn't have my some glasses. dude who needs to hit the dentist. But no, I'll take the lift. Thanks How was a Chad's lot. promo? It feels great. I'm on that at least. Was, it wasn't that he was bad. Committed. You know what? It wasn't that bad. And to me, I have a a different view about like wrestling. Like everybody can't be a body guy. Everybody can't be a muscle guy because then muscle guys aren't special. I think you need. It's like the circus in carnival. You need freaks and geeks and bearded ladies. That, he's, he looked like a big guy. I mean, I think if he has a clue at all, you could do something with him because he, he believes it, and he looked like he was having fun. He did believe it. You know what I mean? Made me believe it. Tyler wants to know, what's your favorite restaurant to stop at on the road? Waffle House. That's such a common one. I guess it's just because of the proliferation. How about well, and where does Cracker Barrel rank? It's got to be up there, right? Well, Cracker Barrel's sweet, but, I mean, Waffle is sweet. It's always open, and what I like is that you, you get to see the guy over the counter, the guy cooking the food. So then, it, it, perchance he's a fan, whatever, then, you know, they hook you up better. Because I'm going, no, no oil, no butter, no nothing. They're like, okay, man, you know. You can communicate with them and stuff. Interesting. And you often get bigger servings that way and stuff. Cajun Sensation has sent us this. Yo, the Cajun Sensation once called the ECW headquarters to see if Adam Bomb was part of the ECW roster when I was 10 years old. And you know what they said to me? They said, go fuck yourself. Anyway, what was up with the WWF greetings on call? Did you get paid? And if you don't remember, here is a YouTube video. I heard of those silly birthday games. Don't know what to get that special someone. Gee, a credit card. Hey, WWF fans, you can make any occasion a special occasion when World Wrestling Federation superstars make a personal phone call to anyone you want by name. WWF greetings on call. Hey, who wouldn't want to get a call from the bad guy? It's fun for all ages when a WWF superstar sings happy birthday. Congratulations, get well, happy anniversary, or just delivers a special friendship. Now Vince was just like I said before, pimping us out, I'm boy. the best there is, the best there was, and... Hello? Hey, Owen. This is Chuck Owen. Kids must be at least 18 years old or have your parents' permission before calling. You can hear the melodious sounds of the macho man, too. It was a simpler time then, wasn't it? I don't remember that at all. It does look so retro, it's a doesn't it? Simpler time. It just looks so retro. How happy those kids were getting a call from their favorite stuff. <laughs> Did you have to do those? Well, obviously, I was in the ad. I don't have any memory of any of that. I certainly didn't get paid for it. I was going to say, it was probably a ton of extra dough. Charles in Detroit, what's the origin of the surf walk, the cha cha, and the spooky fingers? I started surf walking because. As a little bit as Razor, because fans would reach in and try to touch me, and I just didn't want them to touch me. It just kind of turned morphed into that. And uh, Cha Cha, I always did because I was looking for a way to fire, you know, like a way to have fire. And so I came up with that. I always thought you have to have your hands above your waist, you know. And you know, I mean, I thought about it. And Spooky Fingers is just something we were just doing in the locker room. Like, ooh, the guys go, man, fuck you, man, fuck you. Like, ooh. it's really. It's, see, you gotta remember, we came up on Raw. Like, we, we did live TV before they, guys did it. Guys like Hogan didn't come up on Raw, right. live, live TV. You know, Warrior never did an interview on much live TV stuff. His was always produced. Mm -hmm. Hogan was produced, 50 takes, whatever. So we were raised on it. So by the time we got to WCW, I remember one time, like, Kev is face to face with Hulk in the ring, and he said something like, well, first of all, take off your wife's sunglasses. And everybody went like, oh, and we're all going, oh, he like, it just, I don't know how, it just it was something we were all doing. Like, okay. Ooh, I'll tell you what. Because, I mean, guys were doing interviews like, oh, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you and kill me. Well, let me call home so my kids don't watch, you know. <laughs> One time Sting said, man, I'm going to kill Scott Hall. And I remember thinking, Sting, i got to call home now. You know, like, why? You're not going to kill me. Why would you say that? Right. I've always felt wrestling should be about winning and losing. Like, I'm better than you. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Well, I'm going to prove it. You know, I'm going to pin you or make you submit. I'm not going to kill you. Well, isn't that kind of promo rule 101? You, you don't say something you can't do. I'm going to break your leg. Well, if you don't well do when it. you're a babyface, you certainly... Babyfaces are supposed to only tell the truth. Heels are supposed to lie. But 
and the, the, you know, the business was morphing and morphing. It was becoming, you know, like how good were you on your feet? Because live TV separated the guys who could talk and the guys who couldn't talk, you know, and so. Uh, would you consider that an Achilles heel in the business now that we have too many kids that can't think on their feet because they've gotten used to the script? Um, I'm not a fan of the guys giving the scripts. I remember last, I remember being at Hogan's birthday at Raw and they came in and it was me and Hulk and Flair and Kev and Ron Simmons there. We're all sitting in this one dressing room and you know the guys, and these young guys come in and you know, they, I'm, I'm looking at them going, you probably aren't even a wrestling fan. You aspire to go on to write scripts or TV shows and good for you. And you're a writer, you know, you're not like a wrestling right. guy. And I, whatever, I don't know, things have changed. You know, things have changed, so I, I don't sweat it. I just try to fit in where I can. But they gave it to us, and the guy's going like, hey, yo. You know, he's writing what, what he wants me to say. And I'm thinking, bro, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the best I can to say this like this, but I'm, I'm not sure I'll remember it when I get out there because I'm used to feedback from the crowd and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I don't, I, I, got, I don't criticize the guys now. I just really wish some guys would, you got to mean more what you're saying. Don't just say big words. Gotcha. Horsecock Express, if you think this you're... This dude's too much. He's all over the place. Do you have, do you have to pay to ask questions? Because this dude... Well, now there's, a, there's an angle. Well, and we'll make a phone call to yeah, your house, plugging, 995. You're plugging, yeah, right. If you think you're getting out of this interview without singing your part from the Wrestle Rock Rumble, you're sadly mistaken. Cue the video, I, Sean. I remember editing this part, too. I go, yeah, I remember this. <laughs> but you got to remember, this is like, what, 85? 80, yeah, something? 86, 86, I think, yeah. It's, uh, that yeah, was pretty big back then. Look how God. The Showboat Casino, which was known, their their draw was the world's largest bowling alley. Look how young they are. Oh, wait, they show this brown hair chick. Vern's in the ring with Brody. I dated her for a long time after this. Boy, that's an edit that pretty girl into Jerry. Somebody might want to. When we were recording that, it was really brutal because Jerry can't read. And he was really getting frustrated. We told these guys, just go with it, man. Just go with it. Don't, don't embarrass him. Because he kept saying to guys, like, fuck, it's right there. And it was like, no, man. Just that's good, Jerry. Yeah, that's good right, right there, bro. Dude. And they had him dive on a, a, on yeah, a toothpick how, how size that, piece right? of wood. Yeah, how brutal. There you go. The uh is what made it. The uh, ah, uh, look at that. Oh, takes the bump. Out. The uh. Has uh, Larry Zabisco gone yet? He's Did I great. Talk over him? Larry's no, got, a, gotta great, Larry's got a great voice. That's the best. If I told you Nick Bockwinkle was gonna rap in 1983, and he does fine. And he's good. He, he hits the Zabisco's rhythm. Zabisco's great. He's on fire, right, Zabisco, in this? He... That's what it was. Larry was reduced, released a single back when he uh, screwed Bruno. I look at Scott Ledoux. <laughs> Hennig used to sing a song. There's a Garth Brooks song where they talk. They talk about the worn out tape of Chris Ledoux. <laughs> and Hennig used, Hennig used to say the worn out face of Scott Ledoux. Look at this. Watch him make a comeback on Brody. Yeah. Watch Brody know he's getting paid, oh, but he know. knows he's booked in Japan. So. Oh, I know. Look at that. Oh, look, look. Oh, now watch him punt him. Oh. They don't show that. <laughs> look at what is Resnick with the young guy. What the fuck is that? Yeah, how on he has no rhythm. Yeah. Oh, brutal. 
We couldn't have Kamala. We couldn't have no. Ron Simmons. We couldn't have Simmons wasn't on the call. Simmons, well, Simmons wasn't there. I guess it was. That's what we had. All right. So, uh, all right. We get the point. What are we singing this? I'm yeah. Kurt. I'm Big Scott Hall. I'm Kurt Hennig. And Big Scott Hall. Take. See, this is where I switched it because I wasn't going to say dirtball dumbos. So I, I just thought that's too gay. And not that there's anything wrong with that. But tag team chance, we take on them all. So bring on the long riders, those dirtball gumbles. Smear those wimps and do the rest. And I changed it to wimps. Do the rest of Rock Rumble. Ow. Oh. Uh. 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 Uh-huh. Uh. The dirt. Let's get to the dirt. Thomas Morrison, can you recall any details from the plane ride from hell in 2002? I always hear about uh, this, but the details are never clear, except for Ric Flair was the uh, was with only his robe, and Kurt Hennig uh, got into a fight with Brock Lesnar that almost opened the aircraft door at 33,000 feet. I, I think that Kurt uh, H-bombed me, because I've been taking pills and drinking for a lot of years at that point, and I kind of know my tolerance, mm -hmm. and I was out. I remember even Kittle said, man, you were out the whole flight. So I think Kurt H bombed me. So you don't, you I don't, don't even have a recollection? I don't remember any of that. Uh, Liam Evans from South Wales. When you was doing your angle back with gold dust, did things make you feel uncomfortable like the heart tattoo on the chest? If so, what things made you uncomfortable? Then how'd you react to them? I remember when Vince called me in. You gotta remember this is a whole different era. That we're not allowed to fight on the floor. You don't hit guys with chairs, nothing. It's all, and they're real big on family entertainment. And so Vince calls me, and, and you know, they're doing the Golda single, and he goes, We're gonna do this Golda single, you know, we're gonna do this thing with you. And he goes, You know, he's gonna be, you know, he's gonna be in love with you. And I remember thinking, thinking, like, what? Like, I just went through a long angle with Sean, then I worked with Kev, who's like a big killer, and then, like, I'm thinking, and he goes, let me tell you about my first homosexual experience. And I remember sitting, me and Kevin both sitting in Vince's office at TV. And my, I looked at Kevin, my first thought was, as opposed to your most recent, <laughs> like you and Warrior on a bearskin rug. But, <laughs> sorry Vince. <laughs> but uh, I remember, you know, he was telling me about it. And, and, and what the hell did he tell you about? No, he, he was telling me about when he was living in North Carolina, he said I was hitchhiking one time. But see, I, and I don't know anything about Vince's past, but I'm thinking hitchhiking from where? The pool to the country club? Like, what? And he said some guy picked him up and was like rubbing his hand on his leg. And I'm thinking, okay, now you tell me, well, what does this have to do with wrestling? But I remember being a little resistant picked to up it by Terry because. Garvin, man? I remember being really resistant to it because that wasn't the way we were doing business then. Now, it was great and it did a lot, you know, they put a lot of time in it, you know, and everything. And I just, I don't know. It was, if you look at the early Gold Dust stuff, it was really coming across homosexual vibes. Mm -hmm. You know, like later on as he got really over in the Attitude Era, it wasn't that way as much. But it was really strong then. And I'm, I remember feeling a little bit weird about it. I didn't get it. I didn't get why, I didn't get why he had to be in love with me. Like, what was Dustin? Because I remember thinking, well, I'm not homophobic, Vince. He goes, you know, it would be perfect because, you know, Razor would be really homophobic. And I'm going, yeah, but I'm not. I'm not homophobic. I don't, just don't, I don't swing that way. I don't have anything against it. But it's not my style. But uh, me and D Dustin ended up having pretty good matches because some of the stuff was my idea. I said, like, waist lock me then, like, just correct. You know, it was like, whoa. And, and then he had his then wife with him at the time, which was really mm -hmm. hot. So, I mean, we did okay. But I remember not, I remember being a little resistant to the angle at the beginning. And I think it got me and Dustin off on the wrong foot because he thought I didn't want to work with him. Oh, right. And it was like, no, bro, I got nothing against you. Your father started me. But I didn't like the whole gimmick. And I guess looking back, I was being a, you know, like a goof because it, it could have been huge, but it was a way different era then. Right. Um, Horsecock Express returns. What was the WCW locker room's immediate reaction to the screw job? Do you think it was a work? I, I remember thinking, still thinking it's a work because no way on Vince's TV does he allow you to go WCW like Bret did. I think, I'm not a big Bret Hart fan. I, I remember Bret's and I, apparently Brett's beef was he didn't want to do a job in Canada. As a fan of wrestling, when I'm watching a pay-per-view, after they mention it at the beginning of the show where the broadcast is originating from, pretty soon you just remember it's Survivor Series, it's Night of Champions. You don't think of it's ooh, it's Montreal. 
Yeah. You know, I thought Brett was a mark about it. Brett's Brett's really selfish about doing business. It's all about him. He doesn't care about anybody else. The other thing is, Brett's dad is Stu Hart. What if somebody said to Stu Hart in 1965, you know what, Stu? I'm not going to give you your belt back tonight because I don't like this city. What would Stu Hart have done? Brett has to know in dealing with the boss. Yeah, I mean, what do you think? We're not. Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't know what I don't know what Brett was thinking. I don't know what he's thinking now. I never. I remember going to Brett when I was the IC guy, and at that time that was like number two belt. Going, Brett, you have to ask for more money. I said, you can't be happy with what you're getting because I'm like number two and I'm not happy. You know, come on, it's up. You got to lead the way. We called Brett the 400 grand a year champ. He didn't care as long as he got to put everybody in sharpshooter. He didn't care about the money. He just wanted to win. He just wanted to win. And you need guys like that. If you're the boss, that's exactly what you want is a guy like that. You don't have to pay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Kyle Style. Why the hell was Virgil and, Di Virgil and Disco Inferno in the NWO? Is Virgil the only wrestler to get hired based on his huge cock size? <laughs> did you ever real? Re did you ever receive? I just read him. Any royalties? Pays from his autograph pictures that he scammed people. All right, let's take uh, Virgil and Disco. Whose idea was it to bring him in? Um, I remember it, Virgil was one of the early additions to the NWO. He was one of the first couple guys in there. I mean, after I mean, after he was like six or seven, wasn't he? I mean, I'm not sure, but I remember at that time Bischoff was hiring anybody with any face recognition from Vince, and the reason. Now, the reason he's called Virgil was because that's Dusty's real name. Right. And that was Vince sticking it to Virgil. So guess what they called him when he came to the NWO? Right. Vincent. Vincent. But I see, I'm not, I don't have anything against the guy making a living. I don't care. You know, Disco's actually pretty talented. I liked, I, he, I used to take him to the ring with me after Spicoli died. Then I would take Vir, uh, him to the ring. Because I like having, I just like having a young guy to work with out there. You know, it keeps me healed because at least there's two of us. Mm -hmm. Mick Whalen, at what point did you realize that WCW was a sinking ship and that everything was falling apart? What are your thoughts on how and why WCW died? Um, WCW died because it was mismanaged. It was, it wasn't Eric's money. I mean, this is all just my opinion. It wasn't Eric's money. It was Turner's money. And the thing Eric did is after being successful, he moved out of Turner, out of the CNN center and moved to an offsite where really nobody was checking up on him. And we spent more than we made. We made a lot of money and spent more. Right. Uh, I had a great time doing it. Straight shooting LJA has sent this. <clears throat> Straight shooting LJA here from your Monday night football and fix pitch talk. And you know, on behalf of myself, the G Man, and Jesse Fizz, all three co hosts, we love a good obligatory wrestling reference, aka at OWR, as we like to call it on PT Live. And we would like to ask Scott Hall, aka Razor Ramon, aka the bad guy, we would like to ask. A lot of us know about kind of how your WCW career got started, but what happened towards the end? Because I remember Super Bowl 2000 being your last pay-per-view appearance for that company. What exactly happened? <clears throat> I don't remember. I, the Super Bowl was my last appearance? Who did I work with? I don't remember any of that. Anything significant about the end of uh, how your career came to an end in WCW? I remember I was having an on-again, off-again relationship with a girl who was a production assistant for the company, and her uncle was Brad Siegel, the president of TNT. Right. So I did her for a long time, on and off, and we were in Europe where I had mentioned in, earlier that, that sometimes they're really hot rats. And this one rat that I had on again, off again thing is Razor was now there at the hotel wanting to party with me. So I remember talking to her and everything and going to the room and this girl, Emily Sherman is her name, used her position. She was like vice president of international tours or whatever because Sharon Sadella was president. And she came in, she used her st stroke as a WCW representative to get a key to my room and came in the room when I was there with the other girl. And we were just sitting there talking, you know, we hadn't, we had just gotten there. And it turned into a big scene which carried on in the airport later. And those guys, they don't play, this is before 9-11, but they don't play in European airports. I mean, there's guys with machine guns mm -hmm. anyway. So it became like a scene and they just, they 
didn't want me on the plane, so I said, cool, checked in the airport hotel, and flew back the next day with serious heat, yeah. you know. Morgan Scopes has sent this. Hi, Scott. This is Morgan Scopes from ScopesScopingItOut.com. I was wondering, whose side are you on on the whole Hogan N-word controversy? Also, do you think he will be back in WWE ever? And if so, when? Thank you. I just, I talked to Hulk um, the morning after he did the, I called, I texted him and said, hey, good job on Good Morning America. And he called me immediately, like, hey, brother, you, think, you know, he was really amped up and, you know, nervous too, because like, wow, you know, they have the edit, so I don't know what's going to happen. And when people ask me about it, I've been around Hulk a lot and never have seen anything but kindness and generosity from the guy. I've never seen any racism thing going on. But I think... <laughs> It was nearly nine years ago, and his life was in a way different spot then. You know, his son Nick had just been involved in that tragedy. Um, he's going through a brutal divorce, you know, where his ex-wife is running around with some guy that went to school with his kids. I mean, a lot of stuff going on. He's paying a lot of money out of his own pocket to help his daughter Brooke get her hip-hop career going. And the thing that stands out to me, you know, to me, I think... What I've heard is just the excerpts. I didn't hear anything. I read like some lines from the tape mm -hmm. or whatever. And it seems like he's reflecting on it. He's kind of going, well, maybe I am a racist. I mean, doesn't he say that once or twice? Are you familiar with it? It seems, like, it seems, like, seems to me like he was reflecting on it, going, well, maybe I am a racist. Because I think it dawned on Hulk, and I have a daughter who's young, and she's, you know, she's younger than Brooke, but I think you're going... You know, he's trying to get her into hip hop. Then it dawned on him, well, hip hop's controlled by a lot of young, rich black guys, and now I want to bang my hot daughter. And I think he's kind of like, whoa, you know. I, um, do I think he'll be back? I hope so. I turned down lots of interview requests about this because I didn't want to talk about it until Hulk talked about mm. it. I, my position is you think after nearly 35 year relationship with the WWE that they'd have taken a different position. I think they would have said, we're going to look into it. And then I think they should have recommended some kind of counseling or sensitivity training or something like that. The thing that, the thing that gets me the most is people are concerned about, well, Hulk said the N-word. Not the fact that he's banging his buddy's wife during this video. Like, that's okay. You can have sex with somebody else's wife, but for God's sakes, don't say the N-word is the message, right? Like, no one even says that he was still married, the guy's married, so it's adultery, full-blown adultery, which is like one of the ten, and right. don't say the N-word. Imagine it was a black girl in bed. Whoa, oh, you, you said, said it, not me. Quadruple whammy. Um, <sighs> along the same lines, Tony Mirabella from the Bronx, Scott, with the recent re uh, revelations of Hulk Hogan making racist remarks on a sex tape, I have to ask, in all your years working with Hogan, do you ever see racist tenses? We kind of got that answer never, already. Never. Uh, Ramsey. Oh, he said me, right? Definitely worse, Will Man. The only one worse than me is Kid. <laughs> the only time I drive is when it's me and Kid. Scott Hall. Yeah, first thing. Why? First thing, right? Besides the fact that fucking when he's in charge of driving, he actually will piss every time he has to which is every seven minutes. All right. And if, you, if you're driving, you can just keep going by exits and fucking like change radio stations. It's like kind of like throwing up a, like a sparkle ball by a cat. Oh, what? We missed that exit. We'll get the next one. And fucking man, he's he, 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 like, fuck, dude, really? He got bit by a brown that comes spider. Yeah. In the, in the back was like, because he had to stop pissing the grass. It was just tall on the side of the road. I'm like, don't go piss out there. I did. I fucking almost died from that. Where? How did it get you? Where was it hiding? It happened on the side of the road. I had to stop and pissed on the side of the road in Virginia. The next day, we were in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So, and I've got this, and Jake's dad, Grizzly Smith, was the agent. I had that red line, like, going up to my lymph nodes and my groin, and, and he's there smoking sugar. I'm like, kid, you need to get that looked at. 
and I'm thinking, oh, like, go now, right? Like, I'm second match. What does it matter? Right? I'm Jabron. And he goes, just go ahead and go short tonight. And I'm thinking, good, get the blood flowing, and let's move the poison around more. <laughs> but I went to the hospital, and the doctor went, he'd go, you know, I'd swear that's a ground recluse spider bite, but we don't have them in Wisconsin. I said, I was in Virginia yesterday. He goes, that's it. Wow. And he gave me this script for these pills that they give people who have leprosy. Because, you know, a spider bite will... It's necrosis. The skin dies. Yeah, yeah. Now sometimes they have to cut out around it. But anyway, back to bad wheel man. I claim it. I claim it. I'm All a right. horrible wheel man. Horsecock Express was Sherry Martell's bush as glorious as it's been in my dreams. <clears throat> Sherry was so cool, and I always thought Sherry was cool, and she was, and she was a badass. Sherry was a big star way before any of us ever were. You know, and and I'm down with the bush, brother. Bring back the bush. Uh, a, a full, a full '70s style pivot bush, no, or like the mod, landing mod, strip. Modified yield sign is my style. Okay, mo okay. modified yeah. yield sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but not the wood floor. Not, not, not for me. Yeah, it, I, I always find it a little creepy. Uh, Michael Barrymore, as seen in this photo, Shawn Michaels was nearly fully bald at WrestleMania. Uh, uh, excuse me, Royal Rumble '95. How has he managed to hold on to his hair for so long? What is his secret? Does he ever share this with you? Um, no, I think he's just rocking it. I mean, he wears a hat a lot now, but he's just, he's just going with it. Sean's in a really good place right now, so I don't think he's going to sweat that. He's got a beautiful wife and family. I don't, you know. Mendoza Luis, did Randy fuck Steph? I guess that's become such a thing. I have only heard that, like, in recently. When I was there, you know, having been around Randy, I would think no, because he was so awkward around broads. Yeah, I don't see that. I have no idea, though. We asked Lanny, and he said, uh, only two people would have the answer. One of them's dead, the other's not talking. So, All right, and that sounds like a good impersonation. Yeah, he's, he is too much, isn't he? He's, 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 so, much, he's so much Lanny. There's yeah. a lot of Lanny when Lanny's there. You get a lot of Lanny yeah. for your buck. Owen Karaschik. Uh, Mr. Ramon, how's it working for t in uh, TNA for Dixie Carter? Is she as big a mark as everyone says she is? I did TNA's first show back when Jerry Jarrett was the boss. And, and I'm a big Jerry Jarrett fan. This guy is so smart. He made money in wrestling. He made money in real estate and construction. And, but then when they brought Dixie in, and she's one of them, and I think Dixie's attractive. And she would talk to you and she'd put her hands on you. And I'm like, ah. Oh. But I had a really good deal with that, with her. And I'm thinking, you know, like pay-wise. And I was thinking, because part of me's thinking, but this is where I'm getting back to me being shy thing. You know, it was like, Part of me is thinking, well, I'd like to ask you, hey, what do you say we have a drink after the show? And have her go, oh, my God, no, you know. So I didn't because I didn't want to rock the boat with right. the thing. I think she's hot. Then later on, I heard she was banging a bunch of the guys. I went, ah, you know, should have went for it. But, you I mean, I, I've met her father, and he's a really successful mm -hmm. oil tycoon. Mm -hmm. And I have a little girl, and he gave this to her as a toy. And I mean, if you can afford it and she wants it, you can have it. Yeah. So that's what it kind of is for her. It's a toy. Scarface, man. Ramsey from Montreal. In our series Timeline, the history of WE, uh, when we covered the year 1992, Brett spoke about the Razor gimmick. Oh, boy. What a treat. The gimmick, I remember they were trying to come up with a name for him. And uh, he had gone into Vince's office uh, to try to sell himself on uh, getting a job. Did an imitation of um, I think Kurt was in there with him. Kurt took him in. He did yeah, he an was. imitation of uh, Al Pacino or whatever on the Scarface. Scarface and uh, Vince. Loved that him. looks rough. He got a job on it. And, uh, I remember even that night after they he got he was hired and they were gonna do that gimmick with him and they gave him a big push. And like it all happened pretty quick for him. But I do remember Kurt going, "We got to come up with a name." And it's like they, I think they, it was Kurt that came up with the name Razor Ramon. Oh. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was Scott, but I know it was all happened in a couple of minutes in the dressing room. Like, yeah, okay, it did happen really fast. Yeah. Except I was prepared. I mean, I knew I'm meeting with yeah, Vince, with right. so I thought about it. I remember the um, you know, the business was really gimmick driven and merch driven at that time. You had to have a hook, and I remember talking to Hawk, you know, Road Warrior Hawk, talking to him like, man, I need, to, you know, I'm thinking of a name, I'm thinking of a name, because I was kind of going matinee I look deal. So I was thinking maybe Shrug Shadow or something like that. And I thought, eh, you know, and I, and I liked Razor, 
when I pitched Razor to Vince, he went, ah, oh, but there's already Razor running. You know, that boxer I said, I kick his monkey fucking ass. And Vince just popped. You got to remember, Vince hadn't seen Scarface. That's the next Cause question. Because he, well, yeah. he pitched, you know, Vince put pitched to me, well, I understand your father's in the Army. And I remember going, Vince, you want me to be a G.I. Joe? I'll be the best G.I. Joe I can be. I said, did you ever see Scarface? He went, oh, no. And I went, say I love to the bad guy. And Kurt was right there with me. So we're doing it back and forth, just like we did riding up down the road in the AWA. And Vince had never seen it. And Vince left TV and went to South Beach to personally direct the vignettes. And we did like, you know, when we're doing a guerrilla style, we don't have permits, we don't have anything. We're just pulling up and shooting. Right. And then like it will do in South Florida, it just started raining out of nowhere. And I've got a vest on, chains, no shirt, silk pants, you know, slippers. And we they, we go to Miami International. We're walking through the, I'm walking through the airport with Vince now. Everybody knows Vince. Nobody knows me. But they go, well, he must be somebody. And I'm big and young. And, and people go, oh, who's that? They go, oh, this is Razor. Look for him. He's coming soon, you know. The cool <laughs> thing about being in Miami International is not that many people. It didn't, you know. Like you, you, anybody, you can walk yeah. around with no shirt on there and nobody really <laughs> exactly. cares. Yeah. What about the, the chains and everything? Was that, was that all stuff that you cobbled? It was all me, yeah, it was all my idea. I remember they sent a guy from Stanford. I was living in Orlando then. They sent a guy there to take me out clothes shopping. And I said, bro, I can't really buy off the rack. You know, I have to get stuff tapered and stuff. And so I got the white suit that I did wore on the first vignette. And now I know that we're going to shoot these and they're going to air them, you know, week by week. So knowing that I'm getting a big push, I go shopping in Orlando, which has a huge Latin population, so I find a bunch of stuff that I think fits the gimmick. Mm -hmm. And I go to Vince and I go, hey boss, you know, I'll wear that white suit every time if you want. I said, but I've got other stuff. Well, let's see what you got. So I brought it out, oh, absolutely. So I just kept changing, so it looks like time went by and a dude doesn't wear the same clothes all the right. time. Excellent. But we shot most of them in one day. Salvatore M., uh, I don't know if you know, but your interview is shown as an accomplished actor and cinephile. He's also a child, of the, a child of the 80s who, much like the rest of us know, every line from the classic Scarface. The Pacino one, not the Pulp Muni one. Could you and Sean recreate a scene from Scarface for us fans? It could be any scene you want. Uh, well, you would I obviously have, a, have to take the Tony Montana. Part. I have a, um, one time I, in, in Montreal, the... the you know, in Quebec, they take care of their people. Like, to wrestle there, I don't know how it is now, but you had to have French Canadians on the card. The referees had to be, like, at least one French Canadian referee. So the referee, um, the dude was the editor, he was the entertainment editor for the Mo Montreal Gazette. And he would often request to do my masses because he liked me. And uh, so one time I took a picture, like, you know, in the back, like I'm giving him grief, you know. And he had it hanging in his office. He said when Pacino came to town for the Montreal Film Festival, he was touring the newspaper. And he said he saw it and he said, oh, that guy. He said, he does a bad guy better than me. That's hot. That's sweet. And I was going, you swear, man, you swear. You know, it's such so marked out. He gave me, I have a script, all the production notes, everything. From the guy at the Gazette gave me all that stuff. So are we doing a scene? Go ahead, bro. What, um, well, you got you to gotta do Tony, right? So I can do... Uh, all right, the, we'll take a Tony scene real quick here. You got me on the spot. Uh, the one in the restaurant where he's kind of coming to realize that his wife's going to leave him and he's going to be like this rich fucking yeah, mummy. Look at you, what, you, what are you high? Yeah, yeah, but, that's, but there's nothing for me there, uh, and i got to give myself a spot. So right. what about, okay, how about this? You've just shot. This, is, this country's like a big pussy just waiting to be fucked. Well, you just shot. Frank Lopez, and here sits Mel. He doesn't shoot him, though. He doesn't shoot him. Oh. I'm not going to shoot you, man. Manolo, shoot, shoot that, that piece, piece of shit. Yes. I'm not going to. Tell me, tell me, tell me. I'm not Manolo. Shoot that piece of shit. But here's Mel. No. Sitting and watching. He says, you can't shoot a cop. He got hot tonight about the broad. Don't go too far, Tony. I'm not Mel. You are. I, I can't remember all of it, but I remember the part. I remember him going, whoever said you was one. Like, now, wait a minute. Man, he shot him once, and he went, I'll get this you fixed up. You. Yeah. I'll get this fixed up. Oh, you're good, man. You even Make do the excuse. voice pretty good. Why don't you handle yourself one of those first class tickets to the resurrection? Yeah. Yeah, remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, make him first class when he was doing that thing. Yeah, why don't you handle yourself one of those first class tickets to the resurrection? Fuck you! I think he yells, and then Tony yeah. pops. Yeah, you can't do it. You can't shoot a guy. Whoever said you was one, man, you're just like. Kh. Another great scene is F. Murray Abraham when they're sitting outside in Sosa's compound. Uh, I, I like you, Mr. I like you, Sosa. I like you, Sosa. I like that he goes, I got a hand to you, man. You got everything a man could want. 
I got, I got to tell you one time, don't, don't ever try to fuck me. And when he, I loved, I always say that part, when he threw him out of the thing, he goes, that piece of shit, I never, never liked like him. him. I never trusted him. As far as I know, he had my friend Angel Mend and Hernandez set up. I love that because he turns on him so that I never fucking like him. Well, what would you say? Oh, I've used that so many times. I never like him. Piece of shit. I never trusted him. Excellent. Well, and another well, thing well, I use all the time, I used to use it in the ring when he goes, look at you now. Look at you now. Right. You know, well, like, you're still look, look, look at you, you Look yeah, at you that's now. That's good. That's great. Well, Salvatore, I hope that helps. We work for scale uh, here today. Um, uh, uh, Rodriguez Johnson? Confused parents there. I'm a big fan of Scarface uh, starring Al Pacino on the Raising Ramon Gustavo Montana. The scene where Tony and Manny agreed to do the delivery job for Omar. Omar told them they would get in trouble if Fra with Frank if anything yeah. happens. Paul plays C. He's going to stick yeah. it up. He has pets on a rabbit. It's fucked. Right. He throws the toothpick out of his mouth. Did, Did you he? get the, tooth mo the toothpick gimmick, gimmick from Omar? I got the toothpicks from Dallas. Okay. We were gonna we were debuting and they didn't have catering back at those days. We're in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and there's a Waffle House at the end of the parking lot. And so we're paying our bill, we're leaving, they got a little toothpicks to the Dallas goes, I got it. I got we'll both have toothpicks. And at that time he was managing the diamond set, so he would talk and talk, talk, toothpick fell out. I went, looked into the camera, went, bing, and I became the guy with the toothpick. Peter North. When he's not shooting ropes, he's sending questions. Uh, was there ever a time you threw the toothpick and had any blowback? Like it going in another's mouth or it accidentally stuck anyone along those eye lines and did they bitch? The funniest toothpick story I have is one time I'm working in a dark match at TV with Jerry Lawler, and I'm a huge Jerry Lawler fan. And I toothpicked Jerry Lawler and Jerry goes like, oh, and he had on his own taken a toothpick and broke it off, so he stuck part of it. <laughs> He stuck part of it in his eye, and he walked around for like three minutes just selling to the crowd. And Jerry's so good, I just sat up on the turnbuckle and let him do his thing. That's but he walked around like, ah. Oh. Ribs. Let's talk ribs. Earl from Baton Rouge, what's the most heinous rib you've ever saw or heard uh, in your time in the wrestling business? Well... I was schooled on ribs. You know, I spent a lot of time with Kurt Hennig, who taught me so much about wrestling, everything about wrestling, and ribs are a part of wrestling. Uh, Kurt, you know, there was always the thing, you know, you only rib the guys you like. That's what they would tell to you after you'd been ribbed. But uh, Kurt, Kurt would do the stuff that, you know, no property damage, you know, because, like, he was a student of Fuji, and Fuji would give you, like, one leg Bermuda shorts. Right. Stuff like that, or there's a lot of shit ribs and stuff. Um, the, and when I was wrestling with Kurt in the AWA, we 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 were running high school gyms at sometimes during the week, you mm -hmm. know, spot shows. And we go in the locker room, and one time Kurt was pulling on every locker. And I'm going, "What are you doing?" He goes, "You never know." Sure enough, one would come open. Now he has a lock that he doesn't know the combination to. So he would do stuff like, you know, if a guy had a nice dress shirt on, put it through the buttonhole. Or everybody wore snakeskin boots. You know, you got the pull-up gimmick. Uh -huh. You know, you have padlock there. You know, sometimes, I remember one time he took Greg Gagne's bag and Scott Ledoux's bag, because they weren't really seeing eye to eye. Now, Greg has nice designer luggage. Ledoux had some fucking like, gym bag and gave him buddy bags. So that whole loop, they're going through the airport, and this is all pre-9-11, so, you know, they're going through the buddy bags through the airport and through the metal detector, and and because the whole time, because now, and we're just stirring the pot on the whole loop. Like, well, you know, you know, you know, Ledoux, you know, you're going to have to cut your straps because you know, Greg got the designer stuff. He ain't cutting his strap, man. I thought, Dad, I'm not doing it. And he ended up cutting his strap. <laughs> but just little things like that. I always liked it when it wasn't real brutal, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Andrew from Cedar Rapids, I heard a story that you and, Ke uh, you and Kevin Nash told Macho Man that you guys would shave your heads if Macho Man did it first. Is this a true story? Were you ribbing him or being serious? Yeah, we were. I remember talking to Mach. I, I'm a huge Mach fan. My first big time angle was against Mach. It was Machismo versus Macho. And, you know, I hung out with him a lot. I remember, like, <laughs> Mach was so wound so tight. Like, one time he had the custom made cowboy boots from the Austin Hall Boot Company. I remember saying, whoa, Mach, nice boots. What do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, like your boots are nice. I remember one time we were, one time I'm sitting at the airport bar in at the Marriott in Atlanta. And it's, there's nobody's in there. It's just me and Mach sitting like right around the corner of the bar. And he goes, it's not fear. It's not fear. I go, what do you mean, man? And he goes, you and Nash get all the pussy. It's not fear. 
I had to sit there and put Mach over. I had to say, like, bro, you're so cool that you don't even know it. I said, yeah, you know, there's girls all around the world that would die and love to be with you, Mach. All you got to do is ask. You know, he was like, real, like, yeah, I don't know. I don't trust them. And it's, uh, wow. It just, but yeah, we did because he was really doing the comb over and looked bad. And I loved Mach. And we go, Mach, I just shit, fuck that. You wouldn't do it. I said, I'll do it. I'll do it right now. Let's go up to the room and what? And Kevin, I'll do it too. And we said, fuck okay, yeah, well, I'll do it. That's where I remember it. I don't know. You know, we're at the bar. Too. Can I ask you to do the Kevin Nash impression one more time that you well, just yeah. did there? Yeah. I'll do oh. it. I'll do it too. I don't know. It doesn't even sound like Kevin. Well, Kevin I think you're pissed for well, all this. You made him sound like an adult. I'll do it too. Well, uh, you have to go. No, and you got to remember, Kev always goes, well, let me get this right. He always starts his stories like, well, let me get this right. <laughs> It's like anything else. William Casey. Hey, Scott, thanks for doing the shoot interview over the years. You've shared a locker room with some of the people that are considered some of the best rivers of all time in Kurt Hennig. Owen Hart and the British Bulldog. Did any of those guys ever get you real good? Who do you consider to be the best river of all time? Um, all time, I'm going to have to say Fuji. Just, just stories I heard about Fuji. The fucking the dog and all well, that Well, I mean, stuff, right? Fuji, Fuji did one that Kurt would often do called Shit Deodorizer. Like shit in a little cup and just hide it in your room and stuff like that. You know, trouble come up now. Big trouble come up. I think, uh, no, actually one time Kurt did get me. Actually, there was starting to be a little friction between Kurt and I because, you know, I had always been like his young boy and his understudy. And then as I kind of moved up, he, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But I remember one time we're going home. We were in Philly at the Hilton there we used to all stay at. And, you know... Party commences, bar closes, now we're drinking. You know, we, I always ordered stuff, room service, to the room. Okay. You know, a couple 12-packs on ice uh -huh. in the room, so after the bar closes, now I go to my room. Right. And I usually had some chicken breast or something, too, to eat, you know. But I would order it and have it there before they closed. Gotcha. And so me and Kurt there, and then, you know, pills and booze and blah, blah, blah. And apparently I passed out because I woke up with, like, uh, not gone, but, okay. like, little dashes in it. Like little dashes in my eye, I remember thinking, wow, Kurt, you would do that to me. Like, you know, I've been there a million times when he did other guys. I went, wow, like, wow, me. But yeah, he, Kurt, Kurt gave me like some kind of punk rock eyebrow thing that I had to go home to try to explain to my wife. Who gave Waltman the whole deal? Was that, uh, Kurt. Was that Kurt? Yeah. Kurt, both. He did, but normally Kurt, <laughs> Kurt, see, I would often be with Kurt and he would like, he always got with the young guys because he loved it because it's infectious and he said, you know, like you're like a vampire, you suck the youth out of him. Plus, plus, he told me, he goes, he goes, Scott, you always want to be nice to these young guys because you never know who they might turn out to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? They might turn out to be the fucking man. And then you go, hey, remember, kid, remember, remember me, right? I'm with you. <laughs> so, uh, but he would get these guys, and, and nobody can say no to you. When you're in a certain position on the card, they got, they got to come with you. Hey, we're going to the bar. Meet me in the bar. And they got to go, yeah, I guess, sir, you know, they, even if they don't want to. I mean, we, I remember doing it, I remember the click doing it to the Young Guns when they first started, Billy and Bart Gunn, mm -hmm. and going, and this is back when we'd go on the road 20, 30 days in a row, and we'd be, and say, guys, see, see you guys in a bar tonight. So we're not standing together, they're on the other side, we're over here, and, you know, take them shot of Jack. And we, we're across the bar, shots of Jack, gargle, you know, put it down. And after a few, then we switched to Diet Coke and water. But you send them shots. But we send them shots. And then we tell the waitress, because of course now they're obligated to send them back. And then we tell the waitress, no, no, ours, Diet Coke, and water every time. Charge them for the jack, you keep the money. So now they're down to get involved. Plus, we're tipping them good. And then you see those guys in the morning, like, oh, fuck. We're like, hey, what's up? Hey, you know, see you, see you tomorrow tonight. I mean, we just did it where they, they just wanted to go home. Kurt taught me it's easier to go on, it's easier to stay on the road than go on the road. What I learned from Hennig was, hmm. every place we are is a place to be. You know what I mean? We're going to Des Moines, yeah. Like every, you know, like you might, you might as well have fun. That's what I said earlier about this wrestling. Ultimately, is supposed to be fun because you are going to be away from your family. You're going to be on the road, so you might as well enjoy it. And what Pat Patterson told me one time when I was wor working with Sean every night, he was like. Yeah, hey, you know, you guy, you know, you have a good match every night, but you know, you you main event, you're up on the card, you know, you should make it something special. And then we started thinking, like, oh, I get it, like, you're like, really, really, it's next level stuff. And he went, 
if you're going to bother doing this, you might as well be great. I was like, oh. Like, it's like it never occurred to me, like, oh, now be even better, you know? Heat. Matt Standage. Uh, Sean, massive fan of kayfabe commentaries. Haven't missed a show yet, and your shoots are definitely my favorites. I haven't written in before, but when I saw you had the legendary Scott Hall, I had to write. Hey, Scott, massive fan. Thanks for all the memories. Couldn't think of what to write, so there's so many things I want to ask you, but I guess I'll just ask you how you feel about The Rock stealing your ring style, especially your punches. Is it a compliment to have your style used by the great one or a massive insult to have your work ripped off by that jabroni? And, and to me, it's huge, and everybody steals from somebody. And I remember when I met The Rock, he came up to me when we came in as a, when the NWO went to events and you know, we were, we were working with Rock early on. I think our first pay-per-view, he did an interview with us and he was great. And uh, he told me, yeah, man, when I was at the U of M, you know, when I was at Miami, man, I used to love your stuff, you know, I really loved it and stuff. So I was like so flattered, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah, he throws a good punch, so do I. <laughs> The Irish icon from uh, California, hey Scout, maybe Scott, in uh, all the WWE videos where they talk about the ladder match at 10, they always credit Sean for making that match and seem to forget that you won the match and the click uh, helped call it. Uh, does you ever feel you don't get any recognition for your part in the match? P.S. Thanks for the memories, too sweet. Um, no, man, I'm, I'm happy with the way it went down. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people said, no, Sean did it all. You know, one time Sean told me that it was actually going into the second ladder match that we had a Survivor Series. And it was really the first time in any kind of match with Sean that I ever led the match. Because mm. normally I, there was a time in the business of that era when heel calls a match. Correct. And, and really it's whoever knows calls a match or whoever can remember. And, uh, and that night at, at SummerSlam, we had kind of modified the match and I, I called it. And when I came back in the locker room, Sean like hugged me and he went, they were talking about this and that or something. He said, you know, you're the only one who doesn't consider yourself my equal. And that was high praise to me coming from Sean, because mm -hmm. Sean is the best. Sergey from Russia. Your thoughts on Ric Flair's book in which he wrote that Shawn Michaels has made the ladder match at WrestleMania 10 almost by himself and you just happened to be there with him? I heard Flair said something like that. I mean, but Rick always blows me when I see him in person. So, you know, it's like, whatever. I mean, everybody can say whatever they want. I was there. I know what happened. Uh, Andrew Reed, Dave Meltzer gave your ladder match at WrestleMania 10 a five-star rating. You also rated your ladder match against Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam 95, 4.75 to 5. Uh, back in the 90s, did you ever care what Dave Meltzer or other wrestling critics ranked your matches? No, I've never been concerned about that. I care what the people who bought tickets care, feel about it. I care what the guy I worked with feels about it. And I care what the guy who's paying me. I care what they think about it. I don't really care what some guy who can't get laid <laughs> thinks about it, you know. All right, Ramsey, in Bob Holly's You Shoot, he was asked oh, to sure name he had some love for me. the top three crybabies in wrestling. What did he say? Who's the biggest crybaby you ever come across in the wrestling business? Oh, God. Probably Scott Hall. He looks good. Big Mosh asked for the top three WWE locker room crybabies, so you can give him more than Scott if you want. Um, Scott Hall. Scott Hall. Scott Hall. Scott Hall. Scott Hall. I don't ever really been ever really remember being around you, Bob. So back at you. All right, he went on to talk about the click. You know, they just see what they can get away with, who they whose buttons they can push. You know, and of course I was new, and they pushed my button for the last time. We were over in Europe, as a matter of fact, and uh, they pushed my button for the last time. I had nice little words with Kevin Nash. Then I got Scott Hall in the dressing room and Shawn Michaels in the dressing room all at the same time. So actually, I got Kevin. Kevin, we, we had just got to the arena and Kevin was sitting on those those boxes or whatever before we went into catering. And had, you know, had a little conversation with him and took care of it. And then, uh, then I think it was later that night in the locker room locker room, closed the door, Scott was in there, Sean was in there, and I uh, had a few words with him. Got straight in, they left me alone. And that was it. <laughs> that was about five years ago, so I've been dying to hear obviously, what the conversation was. I, obviously it had meant way more to you because I have no memory of that. I don't remember really 
being around you much. I remember your biggest success came to when you got all jacked up on some growth and some steroids and you became hardcore Holly or whatever. I mean, it's not your fault you're in some lame, sparky plug race car gimmick, but you were a race car guy, so that's what they were going with at that time. That's why I was going to end up an army guy, you know. Right. But I, don't, I just find it kind of crazy that some of these guys... The interview was five years ago. Apparently, the events were 15, 20 years ago, and he's still thinking about it. Like, oh, man, I had a talk with him. Let me get this right. Bro, if you'd have had a talk with Kev, there wouldn't have been anything left for me and Sean to pick apart. You know, if you'd, if you'd, have, got, if you'd have got mouthy with Kev, he'd have killed you. So don't take the back part. Let's take the front part. Was he subject to some like unmerciful uh, ribbing by you guys, or or uh... not that uh, not that I remember? Apparently, he's really impacted by it. Uh, he was so low on the card, it meant really nothing. That I don't I don't remember anything about him. Okay, uh, Peter North of all the stiff shots, fist wise, you ever took, who had the nastiest? Can you elaborate with a story behind it? I think Shawn Michaels is right up there with stiffest working punch. Kev is right there. I remember when I, I got done with kind of dancing with Shawn Michaels for, gosh, every night all around the world for nearly three years with, Shawn, with Kev on the outside. Then I had to wrestle Kev with Shawn on the outside. And Kev, Shawn's last match at, at that time on Raw, he was often taking these vacations, you know, he'd get hurt. Summertime. Like, at the ladder, at the ladder, after the ladder match, I worked three times in Poughkeepsie and he was off. And I'm thinking, whose ass got whipped by the ladder? Me. But whatever. Um, what was the question? Oh, oh, no, I, I would say Shawn Sta- Michaels is stiff and Kev is world class stiff. Okay. Uh, Charles in Detroit. Internet rumor has it that you were unmercifully cruel to Doink's sidekick Dink. True. True or false? True. Yeah. Yeah, true. We used to just rib him and me, I think it was me and Pac a lot, and we would put his bag like up high where he couldn't get it. That was it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, just on it. I mean, then one time he was like, he got mad. And he said, okay. And then Owen Hart got involved in it. And then one time his bag was like chained to like the beams at the very top of the arena. And then he came in. <laughs> Earlier he came in, okay, I talked to Vince. No more bullshit. And that's when Owen, that just set Owen off. Oh, and yeah. it just... Um, Manny Motati has sent us a video. Scott, Manny Motati here, one of the guys that filmed the curtain call on May 19th, 't just met those guys I had him arrested I heard as a rib yeah, I, I, t- I told it? Triple H I said let's have the guy arrested oh I love it <laughs> but uh, and and <laughs> he sold it the, the guy who was with him like didn't sell it and he sold it because we went well you actually had the camera right like and it was like yeah and he went and they cuffed him both um, no I remember Vince I, what I do remember about that is I gave my notice 90 days in advance in writing as required contractually which meant I didn't want the contract to roll over it was a one year deal that kept rolling over mm-hmm. it was 10 matches at $150 right $1500 a year guaranteed Guarantee. now, don't get me wrong the money was way better than that but then I felt like I had grown as a performer and I felt like I was more of a part of the company but my pay had started to plateau so I went to Vince and said, hey, boss, you know, what do I need to do to improve? You know, is it my ring work? Is it my mic work? He went, oh, absolutely not. One of the best we got. I said, I'm just curious because my pay is plateaued and I want to make big money like the guys who preceded me. And then he knew, like, something was up. But that's when the whole thing got discussed about, you know, this and that. I asked. Then they summoned me to Connecticut for a meeting. Then I went in prepared. And I said, and this is when it's a private company. It's not publicly traded. Right. Right. And, I, and so in Vince's mind, if you made more, he literally made less. Like, it was like, mm. and I went, 
a boss, like I said. I'm no mathematician, but I do look at my merchandise statements. I said, if we move the decimal point a little bit, I said, would the McMahon family really notice? Because I said, the Hall family would notice. He went, nope, nope, not going to do it. I give you the same thing. And I give Taker and Kev and John and nope, not going to do it. So I said, okay, I said, because um, I was thinking if a fan buys a Razor shirt, that's their money. That's their money, like not your money, that's their money. And then I said, you know, so on the same theme, I said, well, let me, Jim, I still want to work for you, but let me have 12, 15 weeks a year I go to Japan and get their money. And he goes, well, I'm not going to say no because I do let back them go, but <laughs> as soon as I got you over there, I'd need you here. <laughs> and he's laughing and I'm not laughing. Because I thought, well, I came to you with some ways out. I mean, the way that all those guys got paid after we left was merch. Austin, Rock, Triple H, Sean, all those guys, Taker, all making that huge money was off merch because he started giving them 50% of the merch. Mm. And I was getting like .0013, like. But th that's what moved me. So I'm, I, ha I go out with Triple H and rock it. And because I've been, we worked Hershey Philly double shot the night before, mm. Saturday and the Sunday in the garden. And Vince and Pat come to the shows and they sit in the crowd and they watch. But he never sold. I mean, he never came to me and said, hey, let's work this out. You know, what, what do we have to do? He never sold it. And we're, Kev is main event. I'm saying my main, we're selling it. We're doing record business. That night in the garden was the largest revenue producing event, non-pay-per-view that WWE had had at that point. Sold out Master Square Garden house show. Mm -hmm. And Kev's in a cage with Sean. I'm underneath with Triple H, who's subbing for Goldust, because Goldust got hurt in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, like, wow, like, I can't believe it. Like, I felt bittersweet. Like, wow, this is really it. I'm really leaving. I'm going down there tomorrow. Like, what the hell? And finally, Vince summons me to his office. Like, I'm sitting there, me and Triple H just rock it with the match that Pat Patterson gives us. Because before that, we're just going out and wrestling, then he's beating me. And, Vince, and Pat comes to me and goes, you know, you, you know you're over in the garden. They love you here. And I'm like, well, no. And he's going, no, stop it. You know, you're right. They do. Thanks. And he went, he laid it out where I would go out and I'm taking my gimmicks off, you know, giving them to the mm -hmm. ringside guy. And Triple H jumps me and beats me up, throws me on the floor, chokes me with, like, the cable. And I'm laying in the aisle. And so Mark's are there going, man, Razor ain't doing no job in the garden, man. He's out of here. He ain't doing no job in the garden. He ain't doing it. And then they start going, Razor, Razor. And I blew into that ring. And Now, I need to get a hold of that guy. and Because I told him that day in, in Brooklyn, I want to see the match. It's one of my best matches I ever had. And he starts feeding me like a job guy, duck, sack of shit, career ender. That's it. And now Mark's are going, he's not leaving. Because on the way to the ring, half the crowd is going, please don't go. Look at this, bro. Yeah. Goose, I'm there right now. Please don't go. Please don't go. So I hit the ring, bang, and he feeds the job guy. That's it. I pick him up for my finish. This is Patterson's finish. Baby Earl walks behind me. It's Hunter's feet hit Earl. He's down. Everybody in the building knows that the ref is down with me. Right. And the WWE rings are 20 by 20. It's that extra foot. I can cheat over, drop him. I cover him. I don't count myself. You know, I'm waiting. I go, what? I turn, grab Baby Earl by the waist, pick him up. Boom. Pedigree. One, two, three. And I lay there forever. And then when I get up, they start going. Now there's a bigger voice going, you sold out. You sold out. And Vince always stood right outside the curtain in the garden. And it was a short aisle away for house shows. Uh -huh, yeah. not, not like TV. It's right. a real short aisle. And I remember Pat and Mom, I said, you tell him. Give me the money and I'll stay right here. And he just looked down. So then I remember getting on the mic and my whole deal had been say hello to the bad guy. And this time I went say, and I swear, three quarters of that crowd said it with me. I went goodbye and then they all went to the bad guy. And then I left. I hadn't been back to the garden since the Hulk Hogan tribute thing years later, first time back in the garden. So anyway, after that, I'm with Hunter going, thanks brother, that was Great, you know, it was sweet. And uh, sometimes you can have your best match doing a job. Sure. And then they come to me, hey, Vince wants to see you. So I'm like, cool, because right now things are great. I'm not hurt, I'm done, and I'm going to WCW the next day. I have no idea what's waiting, but I'm going. And I know Kev's coming. And uh, he takes me to his office and he goes, he goes, damn it, you still work for me. He goes, how much some sons of bitches offer you? 
And I'm and I'm thinking, Vince, like I came to you months ago. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going, Vince, I said, boss, I don't really feel comfortable talking about this. I said, I've told Eric Bischoff I'm coming down and work for him tomorrow. I said, I didn't ask you to match it. You know, he goes, well, well how much? And I told him, he went, oh, <laughs> that's pretty good money when business is doing good. I said, I, I said, you brought it up, Vince. You know, because now I'm thinking, what? Like, what, bro? Months have gone, 90 days have gone by. You never said, let's work this out. Right. I didn't want to leave. I really didn't want to leave. Did he, was he playing a game of chicken? Did he think that you were going to balk or that you hadn't signed a deal? Memo? Well, see, the thing is, I didn't give my notice till I had a commitment from WCW, right. which meant if I choose to go there, I have all this guaranteed, but I don't have to go. Because in Georgia, you can have a letter of intent, which okay. is binding. So the contract was, if I choose to work for WCW, I'm guaranteed this. But I don't have to come. Okay. If, if I, at the last minute, I decide to stay with WWE, I can. So he still, theoretically, could have kept you. Yeah, but he didn't. And he, and he said, and I've seen interviews where he went later, he went, you know what? I don't blame him for doing it. You know what? He said I would, he, said he wasn't prepared to make a guarantee. Because at that point, I'd have taken less, but I just wanted it guaranteed. And he wasn't prepared to do it. Right. Of course, now they all get guaranteed right, money. Right. Wonder how that came about. <laughs> You're welcome, guys. You're welcome, all you young cats. Same with the the uh, the question of um, creative control. I, we talked about this on the Roos on uh, no on Bischoff show recently, um, when they they all say you know well Hogan had creative control in the contract and when you're on top, don't you kind of have? creative control anyway, whether it's in your contract well, or not. Yeah, and it got to the point that uh, Hulk did literally have, well, he had control of his character where if he didn't want to join the NWO, he didn't have to. Right. And he, you know, he, everything had to be, but it got to the point, you know, business, pro wrestling gets done to me, or at least at that time, by a handful of guys in a one room going, okay, what are we going to do? You know, what, what, what? Because now we're going live. And I have a reputation for being really good at making it happen. So a lot of times, everybody would just look at me. And I, and I would say, well, I think we should do this. I mean, we had a deal where when NWO hit the ring, Pac went first because he's fastest, then me, then Kev. And what we would do, we would hit and then we would feed guys. I mean, after we were already made, mm -hmm. you know, after we'd established that we're badasses, now we would feed the baby faces and then nobody touches Hulk and Hulk cuts the guys off. Like, we propped Hulk up that way because it's the right thing to do. Right. But Rick's 1024 from Wales. Your thoughts on Vince McMahon? Um, the one thing people always ask me is, you know, how big a dick is Vince? You know, is Vince really a dick? And I always go, are you? Because I, you know, I am. I'm capable of being a dick. I think he's really, really smart. I learned so much being around him. By the time leaving Vince and going to WCW was like being a shark and they were like all in it. Like we felt like we were, to me wrestlers always make their money like prostitutes. You know, like you sell your body for money. When you work for Vince, you're like a street walker. You know, how good, you're only as good as your last trick. But in WCW, it's like being a high dollar escort. You know, <laughs> it's guaranteed. And you don't even have to be that good. But I, and, and the thing about Vince is people always talk about him being a genius. And I go, yeah, he's, he's a really smart guy. But also, you know, his grandfather was a promoter. His father was a promoter. So to me, I look at it like if you have a McDonald's franchise and then, your, fa your grandfather has a McDonald's franchise. Pass it down to your father. Your father puts in the drive through Wow, revolutionary. And you come in with like, ooh, healthier kids' meals. You know, or the little toy, you know, the little toy gimmicks and shit. Wow, you're a genius. Yeah, but you started off with a pretty healthy you had a foundation. thing to start with. Yeah. No, nah, but he's the, sm well, he's the smartest guy I've ever worked for. Smith Kara has sent this. This is the same dude. It is me, Smith Cara, the modern day jobber. And I have a question for you, Scott Hall. Was Just Incredible in the click? And what is your heat with Shane Douglas? It is me, Smith Cara. Good shot with the toothpick, buddy. <clears throat> You're over with me, Smith. Don't you worry about it. Yeah, good top, buddy. PJ. Yeah, yes, PJ's in the click. My, PJ's first road trip, 
as Baldo Montoya was with me. <laughs> and I knew him when he was doing jobs. His first win on TV was because of me. He pinned Mike Rotunda, IRS, in a gimmick when they were doing the kill kid thing, when kid beat me. Um, yes, he's click. His first road trip, I did the Kurt Hennig thing, like, yeah, you're with me, young guy. You know, instead of making him drive. Then it's like, like the Kurt here, take this. What is it? Just take it. Take it. We, I remember we, we were in Burlington, Vermont, where I think the University of Vermont is. So it's like a sweet little town. And we were in some bar that was downstairs. And I remember as we're leaving the bar, he falls up the stairs. And these young college dudes are bouncers. They're all laughing. I said, what are you laughing for? He's driving. And they just laughed. I mean, I feel kind of guilty sometimes for being the guy who introduced him to pills and stuff. But... Yeah, he's clicked through and through. Well, it's good to know that that part's kind of been erased oh, from Shane, the click history. The heat with Shane was, um, see, I'm, I get mad at you if you're not a good performer. Like if I have to work for you and with you and you suck, then I then you have heat with me. He came in with the reputation as being great, and my role as Razor was I always say it was like being Tito Santana. I was upper middle babyface. If you if you went through me you would work with Kev or Shawn Michaels. If you couldn't have a good match with me, you went down. And he came in and I'm thinking, well, I could just do with him the stuff I did with Shawn, because he's kind of the same size, probably the same kind of athlete. No, not near, he's, he's slow, he's heavy. I think he's so overrated. Yeah, well, he I said he's this, so overrated. Ramsey. No, I'm sure he buried me. Seth, well, it's more a, a click thing. Yeah, he buried us. Yeah, we're holding guys down, doing this thing. No, bro. It's a Carlo just, Lay story. And as we're walking into the room, the click walks in behind us and taps me on the shoulder and said, hey, we're in the room, whatever. We're getting pizza and beer. Come on down. We want to talk to you. So I go down to the room, and as I walk in, they're talking about this thing with Carl. But they get back into the room, and, and you know, Sean's really just ramp, ramping it up. You know, we should get you dick, motherfucker, blah, blah, blah. And Sean goes, I know. Let's, let's, let's uh, call Vince and have him fire him. And as Kevin went to pick the phone up, I forget which one it was, but it was either Sean or Ray's one. I said, no, no, hold on a second. They put the phone back down. I said, let's think about this. Uh, we, can, we can do better. And they're like, sort of like pushing it back and forth. And finally, you know, I know, I got it. Let's have Vince McMahon starving for two years. And I remember watching it. It was like I was watching somebody be verbally raped. You know, like, there, here's a guy who's done absolutely nothing wrong, has done absolutely everything to help the company. Was that a picture of a and dick, some reference to him that was just there? Because I... Fly first class, they get picked up by limousines as the rest of the grunts, us grunts are out there driving ourselves all over the creation, sitting in the middle seats in the back of the plane. I don't remember uh, any limos unless it was like an office appearance. Who's he talking about? Carl, one of the Bush, uh, Carl Quebecers? Lay, yeah. 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 I, I no, I, enough of this. He's just going to go on and on. I mean, I don't get what his beef is. I don't, I, I don't ever remember ever saying to Vince, don't pay this guy, don't do shit, don't do any of that. But some of these guys revel in this, and he's smart enough to know that if he talks shit about the clique, that it's controversial, and he'll, people will remember who he is. Well, he put on his Dean, gimmick, uh, dean cap and graded you. Oh, he was so fucking brutal. Work. He was so brutal. His, fir see. his first Europe oh, tour. Great. I'd seen him in the past when he would go, when he was in the AWA and uh, the Diamond Stud. Uh, he certainly has the capacity to go, uh, or had the capacity. Uh, but as of late and towards the end of his career, and the bulk of his time on top, I'd say work rate was, you know, B minus. Uh, he, he went, but when that said, when he wanted to go, he could go. He could do it. He had the ability. Uh, promos, I personally just was never into the whole fake uh you know, uh, Cuban, Cuban, Cuban you was. know, whatever, yeah, whatever it was, it just seemed, and that's not a slap, it was a slap to the WWE, it's that whole cornball, you know, cartoon character thing. Yeah, uh, because it's not, not near as start, legit as that, is that Dean thing. Being able to go out and, and maintain a crowd's audience, uh, an audience's attention, rather. Uh, personality, what grade would you give on the program? On the promos, totally, totally uh, the shits. No, not totally the shits, but it, keep in mind they were totally written, you know. So it's uh, uh, in, in that sense because of something that was just written and, and just re basically reading off a script. I would say you know an F. Uh, I like the guys that, and again, that's a slap to That's what the WWF wanted him to do. Personality, I, I think that uh, uh, you 
know, he's, he's, you know, when he had the character of, you know, machismo and all that kind of thing going on, then it gets right back to, again, the, the, the contrivedness of it, the, the, uh, the canned aspect of it, I, just, I, I didn't like. So I would say, a, you know, a, a C at best on that. Would you like to grade Shane on, no, I mean, on the above? I, I don't harbor any ill will towards these guys. You no, know? you don't have to give ill will, but but, but no, a, a report think, card. I just think, wow, super overrated and di- didn't deliver. He came in with huge expectations and fell short. And he, to the point where one time, like on the Europe tours, you kind of had to earn your seat in the back of the bus. And so, but he was new, so everybody's working with him. I got to work with him. So I'm thinking, fuck yeah, I want this guy to fit in and get over and shit, you know, because I got to carry this fucker around. And... But I remember by the end of the tour, like one time, Yoko was one of the big leaders of the locker room. And we're sitting in the back of the bus. And, and Shane is real happy to be Shane. He goes on and on about Shane. And so he's talking this and that. And one time, Yoko went, man, why don't you just shut the fuck up and do what Razor wants you to do? You know, it's just like, by the end of the tour, he was sitting in the very front of the bus on the little seat that drops down from the side, like the little fold out thing, like sitting there like this, like, I want to go home. Uh, Roger Rutherford, hey, Scott, big fan. I was curious about the reaction of the ECW locker room when you shut up there, and Shane Douglas said he pretty much ran you off. Thanks for shooting. Yeah, I did. I, uh, PJ was in town and in Orlando, and they were in town, and he was staying at my home. And so I went to the show with them, and, and when I went in, they were like in there work, like doing some New Japan thing where they're all in the ring, like working out, and like, and bam, bam, and Shane, and I walked in, like, hey guys, what's up? And he went, and now they all feel real bold, like, no man, you know, you gotta go, we don't want him here. And I went, fuck, you don't want him here, I'm out of here, you know, why? Jay Sheen on Twitter, did you enjoy working with Steve Austin when NWO was in WWE? Not particularly. I mean, Steve's a good guy, but we really struggled. He was, he had a lot of stuff going on outside the ring at that time. I think he was going through divorce and my personal life was a wreck. So if I'm not having fun in the ring, then I don't care to be there. Uh, Andrew from Iowa, was Goldberg difficult to work with? Um, not, not really. I mean, Bill's first road trip in WCW was with me. I turned him on to Barry Bloom, who later became his agent and got him paid. Um, he, I remember when he was there, like at the baggage carousel thing, I said, hey, who are you riding with, man? He goes, oh, I don't know. And I said, well, you know, we were in Roanoke, Virginia. And I said, well, you can come with me, bro, because office gets, gets, gets my cars. You know, so you don't have to get a car. Come with me, bro. I know where the gym is. I know where the building is. I know where the restaurant is. I know where the tanning bed is. So, you know, we're set. And, uh. Then later, like we got to the hotel, I said, look, bro, I ain't gay or anything, but they pick up my rooms too, you know? And I knew he was on like minimum wage contracts. I said, you want to save money, as long as you don't snore, you know, we're cool. And he ended up snoring, but. So, you know, we were fine. The only thing that I say about Bill, and he gets a lot of praise, like, man, he was so great. You know, when he debuted, you know, he had it coming in the door. And I go, yeah, he does. He has, he's a good athlete, he had a great look. But you got to remember, he debuted in front of a sold out crowd with energy like crazy. It's, not, it's a little bit different. Let me see you debut in front of a half full arena. You know, like the building was sold out and he had nothing to do with it. You know, he went on to be really successful because he never lost. Yeah. I was against that at the beginning. Not that I was trying to hurt this guy's push, but just being realistic about the business. I remember telling Bischoff, you need to go ahead and beat this guy and he needs to start talking because just who's next? Oh, yeah, that's key. You know, I'd say that'd be me. Now what? You know, I'm next. Now what? What else you got? You know, I, I just think the main thing that happened to him was he became, maybe not all his fault, he became a big mark for himself. And then that got cured when he came to work for Vince because as soon as Vince finds out you're a mark, you're done. Oh, he doesn't like losing? Beat him every night. You know, just, I don't know. Mm. I mean, Bill takes himself real serious and I don't. I don't oh. take me serious, so I'm sure I don't take him serious. Amy, is there any truth to the rumor you refused to sign a birthday card for a young fan that was dying of cancer? Both Bret Hart and Goldberg have commented saying you did. If true, you're literally a piece of shit. I remember being there and and being like really not feeling good, really feeling physically ill. And but these guys came to me with a camera crew and stuff. You know, and I'm thinking and the, the little kid was not present. And I remember thinking I just don't want to be a part of this whole thing. Like, no, thank you. You know, I mean, I showed what I'm like. 
I, like I gave the kid the belt. I didn't care about it being on TV. I'm not seeking any kind of praise for doing charitable works. But yeah, the fact is I didn't do it because it was a bunch of guys marks with cameras want me to sign some card. The little kid wasn't there. And it, yeah, and I didn't feel good. I mean, I literally, my pacemaker head, my defibrillator head fired early that, earlier that day. But I went and did my commitment and did the signing. I was fading so fast that I, I later checked in the hospital. But the, the fact is, yes, I'm a piece of shit. I didn't sign the kid's card. Okay. Kondaris on Twitter. What's your opinion on Chris Jericho? Is there any heat between the two? If so, why? Um, apparently, there is. It's all news to me. I remember, I remember getting in trouble for putting Jericho over on Nitro one time when I wasn't supposed to. And then later on, finding out that in his book, he said, well, I had to teach Hall how to do a small package. Like, what? Like, no. I, don't, I mean, again, like a lot of these guys remember stuff a lot different than I did. Like, they're going, oh, they, man, all those guys were holding us down in WCW. Man, we all got together and left and stuff. And I'm thinking, whatever. Guess what? Nobody noticed. Nobody noticed when you left. You know, like, I, but, you know, he's been really successful, and, and God bless him for that. I. I don't think I have any heat with anybody. If I did, like, I'm over it. Okay. Like, to me, when you watch the Brett Sean face-to-face interview, Brett is still so bitter. It's like it happened to him yesterday. And Sean is so in a different place in his life that he's acting like, well, you know, I don't know, you know. Because Brett's so good. Yeah, then remember that? And, you know, like, I mean, look at the thing Brett said about me. Like, he just looks like an unhappy old fucker, you know. Uh, Derek Anderson says, hey, yo, bad guy, my name is Derek Anderson, and I'm writing to ask, for years, there have been stories about the Click and BSK having a feud backstage in the mid-90s, where your Click brother, Kevin Nash, said in a previous kayfabe commentary production that it was almost like a gang mentality backstage with Click and BSK. So, I ask, how thick was the tension between the two, and is there a certain Click BSK story you can share? Well, I know that the BSK guys, a lot of them went out and got tattoos that said BSK. Now, I thought it meant Beale Street Killers because Jerry Lawler brought this card game to the territory called Beale Street they all played. Now I find out it's Bone Street Killers. So whatever that means. But, it, but it, to me, it wasn't that kind of hostile thing. It was like factions, but not like, fuck you, fuck you. When new talent would come in, it was like, you got to declare, man. You click with BSK, like who you rolling with. You know, it was all in fun. I don't remember it being so hateful okay. and stuff like this. Blue Meanie has sent something for you. <clears throat> Say hello to the blue, to the blue guy. Hi, Scott. <laughs> blue Meanie here, coming to you from the world-famous Monster Factory in beautiful downtown Paulsboro, New Jersey. Uh, asking a great question for the great folks at Kayfabe Commentaries. Uh, everybody knows the NWO was the biggest thing in the wrestling world. Of course, in ECW, me, Stevie, and Nova, we were the parody guys. We did the Blue World Order. Uh, we already know Eric Bischoff wasn't too uh, savvy or too uh, happy with our parody of the Blue World Order. But my question being, uh, what do you guys in the Blue World Order well, in the New World Order, see? <laughs> in the New World Order, what did you think of the, uh, the BWO? Uh, what, did you guys do any uh, internal ribbing as to who played who or something like that? But, uh, you know, before you answer the question, I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, take this question. And uh, thank you for a great, par- a great gimmick from us to parody. So, uh, thank you and uh, see you later. Brian, you look like the gray meanie. You got to get the, the shit. You're out of spray. Um, I, I thought it was really cool. I, to me, like, just like what these guys, these young bucks and stuff, or the Bullet Club are doing in Japan now, I look at it like as, as a tribute. And I think it's all coming from a good place. But I will say, when, when Stevie Richards first came into WCW, and he was part of that whole Raven deal and mm-hmm. stuff, the flock, and I went up to Stevie, you know, before TV, and I walked up and he came over. And Stevie works for Dallas now, so I see him regularly. And uh, I went up to him and said, oh. He goes, I'm Mr. Hi, you do MC I said, yeah. I said, you, you big Stevie cool, huh? He goes, yeah, yeah. And I said, has my partner seen you? And he went, no. I said, he's looking for you. And I walked away. Stevie left TV, brother. He left TV. I mean, he's a contracted guy. He left. Wow. A month or so goes by. Now, I liked his work. And now on TVs, I always wrestled. I'd go out and do a survey, and I wrestled because I can. I'm good at it. And Bischoff knew I liked being in the ring. Like, Kev often would stand on the outside. You know, whatever. He mm-hmm. didn't like being in the ring as much. 
I love it. It was like therapeutic for me. The only time I felt in control of my life was in the ring. And so one time, you know, at that point at TVs, I could pretty much ask for whoever I wanted. If I'm just going to have a match, I said, well, let me have Stevie Richards. It doesn't matter what the finish is. You know, I'll give you an entertaining segment, then we'll do whatever you want to happen. You know, they can hit, beat, NWO can hit, I can just beat them, he can beat me, whatever. I don't care about that. I just care about having a fun segment. Mm -hmm. So I asked for him, he heard about it, he left the building again. Now, just fast forward, that was 20 years ago. Fast forward to like a couple weeks ago, I mentioned it to him in Atlanta at Dallas's yoga studio and go, hey, bro, remember that? And he, and he stills a little bit like, yeah, you know, like I was doing a yoga workout with him the other day, DDP yoga. I'm in the studio doing a workout with him, and on the, they have a big monitor that we're checking everybody's heart rate. And I'm looking at Stevie going, wow, brother, you're really fit, man. Your heart rate hasn't even moved during this whole hour-long workout. And he goes, yeah, it sure went up that time, though, you asked for me at the match. Like, still, like, real kind of nervous about it. I'm going, like, whoa, bro, like, 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 uncle. I mean, everybody is who they are. He's a little bit weird. I'm a little bit weird. You're probably a little bit weird. You know, it's just. In 20 years, he never figured out. No bro, one told him. You want to hear another, was... you want to hear another flashback story? I just ran into Bubba Ray Dudley. Mm -hmm. I, me and Kev at that show in Romeoville, mm -hmm. Illinois, I was talking about where Mongo's bar and restaurant was. They were at that show. Said hi to them. Then they popped up. You know, they were in, uh, they're back to work for Vince now. So then I saw them at, at SummerSlam and stuff like that. I just saw them last week in Houston. But the first time I met them was uh, NWO comes into WWE 2000 or whatever. And they fly me to LA just to have a scan done so they can make a doll of me. Mm -hmm. So I'm there, and this is the first time I've ever met them. So I go, hey, how you doing? Hey, you know, and then the guys are there being replied, like, hey, how you doing? And I said, oh, you got Dudley boys. Man, I love your finish. They're going, oh, thanks, thanks. And I said, yeah, I can't wait to kick out of it. And they went, brother, now five years go by. I'm in TNA. He's in TNA. And he comes up to me, hey, remember that time you said that about kicking out my finish? And, and now just I just have a text. I still have it on my phone from um, Albert is runs the NXT Performance Center. And they invited me to come down. And we're just scheduling time. We actually, I'm going down in the middle of October for about a week to work with the young guys. And he, in his text, goes, I said, hey, look forward to seeing, seeing you, big man. He goes, yeah, me too. Can't wait to kick out the razor's edge. Now, he said it like that. Then he went on to text, yeah, I remember the first time I ever met you. You said that to Bubba Ray. And I said, bro, he just brought that up again in Houston. Like, it's still in his head, hey, you never kicked out, man. Like, you know, like it, it's, it's, to me, it's so funny because it's like, gotcha. Like, oh, this gotcha bubble. I got a bubble online. It's because you play it so straight, so they buy it. I just. That's great. I don't know. I just, I like stern shit. I like stern shit. A scary samurai bunny. I don't know what that means. That's what it means. Oh, same dude, right? I didn't know. Yes. And what's your deal with me? Did you get along with him? Yeah, I get along with Raven, okay? I just saw him in Atlanta at the screening of the movie. Um, yeah, I did tell him, no, bro, somebody's already doing that. Get something else. Chris Bart Williams from Nottingham Forest. You have hung up on Wade Keller the last two times he's had you on his internet radio show. It seemed like you were pissed off that he kept bringing up past substance abuse problems uh, and trying to play junior psychiatrist, kind of like I did today. Uh, instead of interviewing you as his audience had been led to believe. Is that um, I did a recent interview with him, and I only did it because it was something Dallas had set up because we're promoting the whole Jake the Snake movie. Go to jakethesnakemovie.com for info. What, now I remember what I didn't like about him was, in, as opposed to this, where the fans are asking a question, and you're just kind of steering it through it, he goes, well, Scott, you know, this and that, and after all the things you've been through in your life, and the numerous rehab stints, and this and that, and that, and that, and, that, and, that, and, that, and what, would you agree? Where you get to say, oh, yes. Like, instead of saying, well, what are your feelings on this? We and you, and you get to talk. Answer. He does the whole thing. And I remember, and as I saw that going on, I just went, hey, I just want to say uh, it's great to be here. Thanks a lot. Because in my mind, I was only going to go about 10 minutes anyway. I think I went five. I went, hey, thanks for everything. Remember to see the movie. Thanks a lot. Bye. Because I didn't want to do it anyway. 
Which brings us to Todd Hamilton from River Edge. Talk about the ring roast from 2008, which we actually produced for the Iron Sheik. Okay, Where I'm, you were I, there with Jim Powers. I remember that I'm invited to come into the show to sign the day before. And I'm not doing that good back in those days. Really openly. I'm drinking like a son of a bitch. I was, and I wasn't a part of the show, the Sheik's Roast. So I'm up right. in the room taking pills and drinking with Jimmy Powers and his girl. Then the phone rings and the guy, the promoter, hey, would you guys come down? You don't want to come down? I'm looking at Jimmy going, what do you think? No, I, I, I. So we go back there. The, now, see, now I'm loaded. I remember. And, and the guy who was hosting it was pretty fucking brutal. He, he, I don't think he was that good. Was Bill he Bill No. Was he you? No, whoever was, somebody was up there trying. Oh, the comedian. The comedian. Yeah, yeah the grand. comedian guy. And I was going, you're fucking brutal, you know. And so then it started back and forth. But the thing is, then the guy went, like, made a comment about Owen. Right. You know, he, said, he said something like, oh, Scott, oh, your fucking career fell faster than Owen Hart from the ceiling. You can say whatever you want about me and my career. Thanks for watching. Obviously, you were watching, paying attention, right, bro? Thanks. Um, but wow, like, man, don't smear Owen's name. And I'm really close with Owen. I spent time with him. In Europe, we lived in trailers side by side each other. Our, you know, we were both married and our wives would jog together. And I was in Japan with them. And like, Owen was not connected with drugs and booze in any way. And for the guy to just go for the cheap pop after that, and yeah, I am Captain Redneck. You get a few in me, fuck you, man. I'm so happy that I was fucked up because had I not been fucked up, I'd have got to him. Jim Powers couldn't hold me back. Well, you got to him. I'd have got to him and fuck. <laughs> you had him, him against the wall. I don't remember much of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had him. Oh, and, yeah? Uh, yeah, well, we kind of, I ran up a little nervous. I did have a release in my hand so that we could get it on the video at least. But uh, Thanks. But it was a different time. It was. It was I mean, I was a different place in my life. I was. I didn't give a fuck. I didn't like me, so I didn't care what anybody else thought about right. me. You know. But well, yeah, I mean, you know what? I apologize to the Sheik for like, <laughs> hey, sorry, I ruined your night. You know, sorry, I bogeyed your moment. Although Sheik's guys, I guess the guys from Toronto, contact, business managers, yes, they contacted me and wanted me to be part of some thing Sheik was doing out in California or whatever, and. A live event? I don't know what it was. They yeah. want me to be this. Sheik has nothing but love for you. And I'm thinking, I've never even crossed paths with the Sheik. The only time I remember being in the same room with the Sheik was that night. Oh, you know? Really? Yeah. I never was in a territory where he was or anything. Well, you are in a better place now, I could say firsthand. Well, so far. And I, I ain't drank so far today. One day at a time, right? That's what they say. Yeah, brother. Stitch it on a pillow. Thank you for agreeing to shoot thank with you. your fans. My pleasure. And thank you for watching and participating.